forward. Okay, we are recording. Okay, welcome this morning um, to the first day of Overview Beginner Training. And we're gonna have, like you said, there are gonna be three days of training. Um, my first day here, um, I will be going over the homepage, which is the reports and the core and adding an employee and what all the core um, options um, do. And then we'll also be going over the employee dashboard today. Um, again, this is a three hour um, training. So hopefully we get through everything. Um, again, if you have any questions. Oh, again, I'm Andrea. I guess I forgot to introduce myself. Um, I know some of you have been here um, or been regulars with um, Redesign, is that correct? Everybody's pretty is kind of familiar with redesign and how it works. I wasn't sure. I know Carol. No, I'm completely brand new. Uh, is this Jamie? Yes. Hi, Jamie. Well, welcome to uh, to redesign. I'm glad you can be on board with us. Oh, we have one more employee or one more person coming in. So I will try to go through it so it doesn't confuse you, Jamie. Um, cause there's, um, so many things that are connected on the redesign to, uh, payroll side of things. So if you don't understand something, please ask a question, unmute um, yourself and ask. So, okay. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. And again, this will be recorded. So again, if you want to go through, uh, oh, I'll watch it again, you can do that. So, okay. I think we got all our people now, so we are good to go. So the first thing we, like I said today, is I'm going to do the home core and the employee dashboard. And the first thing is your homepage. And your homepage would be all your options of your pre-divine reports. This would be a list of all the reports that us at SSD, SSDT has created, plus any reports that you may have created and are using currently. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between my PowerPoint and the actual um, in my Andrea doc so I can kind of um, show you um, a little bit by, all right. So here is, oh, let me get to the right page here. This is your homepage and you'll find that right here at the left hand. And then this, like I said, lists all your reports that um, here that we have created for um, the districts to use here from the uh, SSDT plus any reports like these are the reports that I have curated or imported in from maybe somebody else in the district um, that shared their report with me and um, they show here. Okay, so um, the other thing is I wanted to show is you see the show only favorites. If you had your show only favorites marked and how to mark, if you wanna make this list shorter, don't like it being so long because you know maybe some people in the districts uh, don't use all these reports all the time. Every, every employee has their own, um, what they do in the office. So um, maybe the accounting or uh, payroll side, um, they can only look at certain reports. And I know I'm bouncing back here, but over here in reports, that's where this option would be. And all that is under report to report manager is a mimic of this home. Just you can do a little bit more things with it under the report manager. As you see, it lists exactly the same reports. And here is the favorite. So if I wanna see, because I work with these reports every day and that's all I wanna show. And maybe like I, since I'm in payroll, I wanna see the future amount um, payroll report. Maybe I wanna see the wage report and maybe the payroll item detail report. So now that those are checked, if I go back over here to home, now that's all I see because that's all the reports that I wanna see. I don't wanna see um, any other reports at the moment for those. But if you wanna see more, then you do the show reports. And again, that just opens up all those reports that were there before. So it just um, gets those down a little bit, a um, little more of a showing on the page so you don't have to sort through all those if you don't use them all the time. 
Okay. All right, the next thing is, okay. So when you're running a report, um, the next thing is, uh, I, let's see, we'll just do account history for now. We have where they're the start dates. There's some reports that you can put start dates and end dates in. And what the shortcuts, you can see that this, this is a P and a T. That means it's the posting period start date and today. So some reports will have maybe the fiscal date in there. So that's going to be F and L, F for the start and to the, um, and then the L. And here is the PowerPoint I would just show. As you can see here, um, hopefully you can see that. Oh, I made so small. Looks like it's so small. And so here is those um, shortcuts. So again, you can use the uh, month, day, and year if you want to and, and enter that in. Or if you know your date shortcuts and um, don't know how many of you use those, but they are there for those reports under home, and you can just add the W or the K. Oh gosh, sorry. The cat wants to join us. And then the period posting. Um, is another one. You can do the first day of the current posting period or the last day of the posting period. And all that is, is the beginning of the word in the end. So again, we have this in our documentation, a list of this under the reports of these date shortcuts that you can use. So they can come in handy if you don't wanna, if you just wanna report for the quarter, you can do Q and U. So those, it's uh, just a, a little option that you can use here in redesign. Okay, so now we're gonna be, be jumping to the reports itself. And I'm not gonna uh, run each report because that can take up a lot of time um, on the history of some of these where it can take a little bit to run, but I will go through most of them and what each report shows. And again, if you want me to run the report and you'd like to see it, please let me know. I'm gonna move my PowerPoint back over here. So this first one is the report for okay, the account history report. And again, these reports here are the ones that I created. So you guys probably you won't see them on yours or because these are just the ones that I use. But down here, SSDT, these are the reports that everybody would see. So the first one is your account history report. And again, this is gonna um, list your employee um, name, uh, employee number, the name, like the position paid, stop date, um, what position number it was in the e expenditure account. And I'll go ahead and see if I can run this one without any problems here. And let me see if I can do that. And since these reports have a lot of information, they do take a little bit longer to run. Here we go. So this is what this report looks like. It's going to show uh, the employee name, uh, the stop, the stop date of the payroll, and then the name of the person, and then the account expenditure they were paid out of. So that is the, this is what your account history report will show. And as of right now, it doesn't show the chargeable calculation. I believe that is a bug. So that is a no one issue. Okay. No, that's my next report because that's big. Um, the next one is your SSDT um, account history report. Oh, I clicked on the wrong one. We want this one, the V2. And the one thing I did want to mention is um, right here, the most recent and the default. The default would be um, if you have never ran the report before, and it would probably show as default. But once you start running it, it's always going to show most recent. And I know we've had an issue where 
sometimes uh, one person can run the report and then somebody else tries to run it and they're getting nothing. And what we found out was uh, for some reason, the uh, most recent um, was clearing out information or something and it didn't put on the report. So we just had them go back to default and it ran fine. So just a reminder on that. Um, you can also um, name this report. If you don't like it as account history report, you have your own name that you use to put in there. You can type in test count. I'll just do a history. And now I'm gonna save it. And now these options are available, which is your delete. And you can um, create this report and save it. And then you can send that report to an email that report to somebody if they need to see it right away. Um, and that when in the drop down, now you see it in here, that's history. And then if I wanna take this report and say, I wanna send this report to somebody, you can open up that link, report direct link. And if you wanna include the perimeter, so they know how did I run this report? You can include that on the, on the report and that's report options. And then what you can do is click on this Let's take a little bit. And my computer is running slow this morning. I noticed when I was just doing some testing this morning before the training, I could tell my computer is running slow today. And of course, of all days. So, okay not liking it. Okay, I did run one already and saved it. And I don't remember which one it was. But what it will do, you will open up a box where you can save it under your desktop or documents, and then you have that report. Then, like I said, you can email that to somebody if they need to use that report right away. And all it does is just, it just creates a report right for you. And it's, yeah, not liking it. So we'll click out of here. But that's what that perimeter is for, is that you can just create the port and send it right, uh, save it to your desktop and then send it directly to somebody to email them that report. Um, now that you don't want that test history report anymore, maybe you can delete that. So you cannot de delete any of the, as you see, when you go back to default, you can't delete it or share it or most recent, but you can do the test history. So we can delete that. I don't need that. And now it's deleted and no longer shows under here. So now we can go back to our default report and that's what there. So I just wanted to explain what those options were for. Okay. Oh, see, there it is finally. So now it finally came up and then our account history. So, and this just shows the history of all the accounts and the amount charged and the percent. So, and it just shows the position number, employee number, the report of the person uh, or the name of the person and how much they were charged on that account. Um, again, under the account, um, History report for uh, version two. Um, again, you can run it by start and end date. If you wanna uh, just check on employees, what he was all paid out of, what accounts, you can check out this, um, enter the employee number here, or you can run it by any part of the expenditure count. So this is a good report to run if you need to look at um, the account history of any employee that was paid and what accounts there was. Okay. The next one is your adjustment journal mass load extract. And what this is, is for you, the ones that know what the um, adjustment journals is, um, under here, under core, once we get down there, there's this adjustment area. And this is where you would do, you have to make any adjustments to uh, certain things in um, for employees. And 
If you want to see any adjustments that were created under here, this is what this home report is. And it will show all the adjustment journals that were created. And then if you need to sort it to look for an employee to see, oh, I know I did this adjustment, um, but I couldn't. You can also use the grid and create the report too. But if you want to just create a report right away, then you can see, um, you can use this. And then you can use that also to, if you need to make an adjustment, maybe you did an adjustment for um, 100 people maybe for something. And you're like, oh my gosh, that was wrong. You can use this extract and pull it in and create it in, and then go use it and actually um, mass load that back in. So if you find your find the ones that you need to correct, it will, and then you can search for those employees or search for that payroll item, adjust that amount that you uh, maybe corrected it for, and then you can use mass load and load that back in. So two options on that. You can see what adjustments were out there that were recreated, or you can use it to uh, mass load, make corrections and use mass load. Um, the attendance journal, this will list all the attendance. Again, under core, you're going to have an attendance. And this is where that this report is pulling from is right here. And let me go back to oh, home. So reports. And then if you create that attendance report, again, you have query options. You can do, uh, I believe that's the month. Um, you can run the report for any active employees, inactive. You just type it in exactly how it is. And if you want to do uh, like just uh, active comma inactive. Um, appointment type, you just want to run employees that are certified. Um, and then if you want to run just the attendance that you entered in for a certain amount of time, then you would just type in attendance or ab absence here. But if you want to do both, you just leave it blank. Okay. The next one would be your um, audit and audit trail and audible events. We suggest you not to use these because they are when they bring in a lot of history. And we found that if districts try to run this, it can tie up a lot of time on their system. So we suggest not. Preferably, because these were the first two that we created audit trails in the beginning of redesign. And we have worked a lot to update the audit trail. And we actually created one now that it's under reports. And if you go down to audit report, this is the one we suggest you to use. This was this one is nice. It shows you can run it by any object pretty much now. We've been updating it slowly through the year and adding it um, all these different core options that you can now run it. And then you can run it by your start and stop date. You can run if uh, you know uh, the district knows somebody made changes and they know who it is, the username, they can click on that and bring that over. They can select employees now. So if they know they did it, uh, they got to check to see something was changed on an employee and they don't know why or who did it, they can check just that employee and they don't have to run it for the whole district employees anymore. So you just click on it and add. If you want to remove it, remove it. So I had just done some payroll updates, I believe, this morning. So I will just run a, I'll show a report for you so that way you can just kind of see. And then again, you have the select operation on here. You can, anything, maybe you added a new employee. You can run it by the, um, check all the employees that were just added recently. Do it a certain time, certain box update. Modified. I know I modified a payroll item, so I'm going to select modify. We also have delete and you have or all. If you do all, it's going to show everything added, modify, delete. Um, if you select an employee, then it will select that employee. So I will run it just for modified. Just so I can show you what the report looks like. So here is your report definitions, how I ran it. I didn't run it for any employees, but it does show the timestamp. 
uh, when I when that time when that was changed. So now they can go in and say, oh, back a week or two ago, somebody did change this at this time. Who was their username? What operation was it? I modified it. And what modification did I do to this payroll to payroll items on that date? And it will show what field, what's um, what field name it was, what the old value was, and, and what the new. If there was no value in it at the time, it's going to show null, and then it's going to show a new value of what you entered. So this is pretty nice. Shows the employee name if it was attached to a position. <clears throat> the payroll item, it will show that, and then what payroll item code. So again. Um, we definitely prefer you to use this one because this one has come a long way. And again, it's just an easier run um, and faster it, than using those uh, first um, audit reports that we created in the beginning of um, redesign. But they are out there for you to use if you want to just be weary, make sure you use your start and stop dates, maybe um, do little, little dates at a time. Same thing goes for your audible events. Use a little dates at a time because it brings in a lot of history. <clears throat> okay, the next one is your birthday report. Um, again, pretty well self-explanatory. Um, it just lists all your employees in the district um, and their birthdays. Again, you can run the report by building code, start and stop dates. Your Checksters Advance Report. This is a report that when your, your district is in advance over the summer, you can run this report and it will list all every payroll. You can run it actually if you want to keep track and make sure you're balancing what was what was um, deducted or you know ran for stirs for the employees in advance. You can check this every month or every payroll. And then at the end of your STRS advance, you can run this and use that as your balancing tool. And again, it's going to start with the year, or you can do your fiscal year. And again, it shows the name, the code, the social security, and their total serves advance for each payroll. And then the next one would be compensation journal adjustment mass load. You can use, again, this is another one that you can um, extract it if you... Um, it will show all your journal adjustments. And again, let me switch back and forth here a little bit. This is looking, this report is looking, if you're under core and compensation, is looking at your um, employees that have your compensation or the contract compensations down here at the bottom. You're going to see this box down here, compensation adjustments. That's what that report is looking at. So if there was adjustments made, maybe to the amount paid or earned or amount docked, days paid or days worked, it will show in that report. So if I type in 50, I'm gonna save it. Nope, doesn't like it. So let's just do that, let's try that. There we go. So now I typed in 50, so now it shows in here. Now, if I go back to my report, Home, show all reports, compensation, and I run. And again, you can use this extract as a mess load if you need to make corrections. Again, if they did a big uh, compensation adjustment for maybe uh, a, a many employees in the district, they can also use this report to create an extract, which is ready to go for mass load, has your column headers in here. And oh, I guess it doesn't show what it, I actually did. I thought it did. But all it does is just pull what the, um, it, it actually, okay. So actually this report is for just the extract of the compensation. So it pulls every employee into this report. So you can add your mass load headers for the remaining to load in there. So you can add those other, those five fields I showed you, uh, pace, pay, compensation. It, it shows, it will pull that in and then you can add those um, updates to this report and use mad low, mass load and put those in, do a mass uh, load change if you need to, 
So, excuse me, I thought it was a report that actually showed it, but it wasn't, it's the extract. And then you can use this report in mass load to load back in with the changes for a certain employees. Again, you'll probably have to go through and find the employees that you want, or you can just use the headers and then add your own employees in. So, okay. So, all right, there's just so many reports and they can just do so many different things. Hard to remember all of them. Um, the employee hire date, that is self-explanatory. Um, it shows everybody um, what their hire date is. So if a district needs to uh, get a list of employees with higher date, you can show a greater report on that. The next one, same thing, termination date. So if you have employees that have a termination, you wanna see who all has a termination date listed and that comes from the employee screen, I believe, um, then you can um, run this report. The employee wages. The employee wages would be, um, their wages as of date uh, will show the month, quarter, year to date, and the fiscal year to date um, of the posting period that's open. So again, this just, just shows your the wages for the employee. Future pay amounts, this would be everything for um, what is listed in future. And it just summarizes the information that is in the under future, um, up here under future. Who, who is going to be paid? Um, or maybe they did a um, import for future for pay accounts, pay amounts. They can run this report and make sure they have everybody in there. And I don't believe I have anybody in there. So I probably will not run. The info patron extract, again, this can be used um, for is relisting, has your name, address, building. Um, like birth date, the gender position number, and then it shows their job status and their contract amount. And they can send this then to the Info Ohio patron um, and send this information. Um, I'm not sure if they send that once a month or every year. I'm not certain when, what, when districts send that uh, report out, but that is the information that, the, that they are asking for. It's all in that report. Uh, the new contracts payroll account, um, this would be if you're working on new contracts and you're in new contracts under processing here and you have a bunch uh, ready loaded in a bunch of employees getting their contracts changed and you want to see what their um, payroll account or their uh, new contract payroll accounts are, you can run this report and it will pull in all the accounts that, that is going to be tied to those new contracts. So if they changed a the, uh, payroll account or if they didn't, it will just pull in what the count that they were using before. Same thing for this new contract summary. It will list everything um, in what you have uh, new employees in the new contract as of right now. And what um, it would be just a summary of... Um, it would just be a breakdown of what shows a new contract. So like your contract amount, your obligation, pays per period, things like that. So they can do a double check if they wanna run the report and check off with their sheets, uh, making sure that everything is balancing, they can run this summary report. The non-contract compensation mass load. Again, this is if they wanna do, um, for employees that are maybe like bus drivers that are on timesheets, subs that are on timesheets. Um, this is a, um, they are usually set up with a non-contract instead of a contract compensation because um, they are timesheet employees. So they can use this extract if every fiscal year, if they need to run it and they can um, use this, it creates a, a extract with the headers in it for them already. And they can go ahead and update their um, unit amount. They can update their, I'll show you what it looks like here. I have so many ran already, just so you know what it looks like. Here it is. And then, like I said, it has the headers ready for the mass load. It pulls it directly from their contract compensation screen or non-contract. And then from here, they can go ahead and um, modify the spreadsheet to include who they need to include and then change their unit amount maybe change, maybe their hours and day changed. So they can use this sheet 
find the employees, delete the rest, and then use MassO to load this back in and just make the updates for those employees. Okay. The next one is outstanding checks report. Um, again, this is would be any paychecks that um, are still um, not reconciled yet that not have hit the bank and they can run this report anytime they want. Um, again, you have your query options of when you wanna run it. So I'll just go ahead and run it and see if it, uh, I get anything here. Yes, I do. So here we go. This is just all my paid um, check that are still sending is outstanding. The next one would be your payroll account report. Um, this would be a list of all the accounts for your employees. So what the employees payroll accounts listed as of right now, you can run this report and list each employee and what account payroll accounts are attached to um, them and what the percentage is. The payroll item detail, this is just a report that shows what payroll items I have listed out there right now um, that they currently have for the district. Maybe. Of all days for my computer to be stuck. There we go. And there's the report. So what it lists is just uh, the employee and what their um, payroll items are listed as. What currently do they have? Pay cycle, if they have a max amount, start and stop date entered. So again, you can run this and then you can search for an employee. If you wanna make a double check, you can do that um, on this report. And then the next one would be your payroll item history. So that would be the employee's name and the payroll items and what uh, payrolls have been ran and what how much is in their payroll item um, for each employee. So again, you can run start and stop dates. If you're looking for a certain time of uh, a payroll. She's listing. Maybe. Um, why it's generating. Down here at the bottom, you see these arrows. It's just, all that does is move these boxes up here. Just moved it over to query, moved it over to sort options. So it's just another way to jump to the boxes. Um, another thing on the format for all these reports, you have options where you can run um, by PDF. Now it decided to run. Let me go back in here. But you do have the report options, again, under all of them that you can run them by PDF. Um, you can select different ones, like Excel. Um, so CSV, you can use this to change if you wanna run it in a different option. Um, again, you have different page size. If you wanna run it portrait or landscape, portrait or landscape. And then again, if you have a name for the report that you need to call it, maybe every, you run this report every payroll, you can put in what the payroll date is for payroll such and such. And then that will run and it will be printed here on the top here. So that can be changed. Um, you have the option to run it in a summary and not all of them, sometimes the summary report on some of them work and some don't. And then again, you have the option to show report options. Cause right now when I ran it, you don't get a like a, a first page where it shows all your options of how I ran it. You don't see that. So you can run that if you need to see that on the on the report. Let's see if it runs in a summary. I don't know if this one does. Some reports run as a summary and some don't. So we'll just check it out here. But this is uh, the detail report I just ran. And as you can see, it shows the employee, the start and stop date for that um, payroll. And then what was deducted 
for each of those taxes or their payroll items paid and what their grand total was. Okay. And then this one, yeah, it doesn't show. But it, it would on the reports that you can do the summary, um, they do have that option. Um, the next one is the USP role listing. And this one would be um, for a list of employee roles. So this one is just listing what roles um, are out there for employees to use. That's all, that's all this role uh, list would be. The next one would be actually what employee users are listing for the auditors, because the auditors like to see this, I believe, when they're having their audit. Um, what, what access does each employee have? And that's what this list. So I'll go ahead and run this one. And again, you have your query options, and you can run it just for administrators or stand-in or read-only user. Or excuse, excuse me, that excludes, excludes the roles, excuse me. So if you type those in, it would exclude them. But if you want to run it for everybody in the district, then you can go ahead and do that. Oh, you know what? I don't like how it runs that way. Because right now it's set up as tab, and I just want to see as PDF. There we go. Okay. So here is the list of the user listing report. So as you can see, the username admin, which is me, um, last login, when did I log in? Today, what time? And enabled, is it locked? It would be checked if it was locked. Password, uh, when does the password expire? And what are the roles? So again, this is what the, probably your auditors for the districts will want to see. And then again, for the user listing report, that's just a listing. Again, you can run it exactly the same as the other one. And that runs in PDF. And that just looks like this. So kind of similar to this one. It's just it doesn't have the breakdown of what those roles are right here on the side. It just has the uh, administrator. The next one is your wage report. And this is just gonna list a uh, report of the district's current um, like obligation for the employees. Um, accrued wages, I believe, um, contract, contract amount and obligation. So we'll go ahead and run that. Look out of some of these, I'm getting too many reports here. And this one, you don't have an option to want run by query. And also down here, while we're waiting, there's this little button here. And there comes the report. There she comes. And this is what this report looks like. It just has your employee number, last name, first name, position number, description, and then it has the compensation. So again, it has how much, uh, how much do they have right now in their contract or compensation one? $50 amount paid, accrued wages, pay per period, pays in contract, how many, that's how many they've been paid so far, and pays paid, or excuse me, pays in contract, and then how many they've been paid so far. So it's just a detailed report of what is showing on there. Um, so if you want to see a, a bunch of people and you don't want to go to each con contract compensation, you can just run this report. Um, again, what I was saying down here, for is this button down here. Schedule as a background or periodic job, which Lori will be going over more, um, I believe on Friday, is how to schedule a job if they wanna run this job. Like every morning, they say, oh, I need to run this report every morning and I want it to be emailed to me. They have that option to create that, to schedule this report. And again, that would be, um, more in detail on, I believe, Friday when Lori has that. But that's what this little thing uh, button is down here. So the districts can schedule um, a report and it can be sent to an email. And then they can enter in a Crone expression, which means what uh, the date and time of when they want that report to run, maybe in the middle of the night when before they get in. So that way it's emailed directly to them, they have that option. 
Okay, I think I went through everything here on the home screen. Okay, I think I ran through most of the reports as much as I could. Is there any reports that you have questions on or you want me to uh, run through them again? Or maybe don't quite understand what a report does? Okay, I think we're good there. Okay, awesome. Okay. I know I went through those kind of fast, but like I said, um, to get everything in and one to, for today, what we're going over. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna be going over, back to the PowerPoint. And again, the PowerPoint is out there um, where, you, where you signed up. I have it out there where you can click on it and print it out if you like, and, and um, use it for notes or something for a later date, you can do that also. Okay, because I have pretty much what I'm explaining is on each of these. Okay, so next, now we're going to core. So core, uh, this contains the central pieces to your payroll. Um, this would be for adding new employees, modifying employees, and adding the employer your portion of uh, data. This is where you're going to find all this information, your key stuff. So the first thing I want to go through is the mass change. And mass change is um, pretty much is almost on all the core options listed. So once you go here, right here, this mass change option. Now, again, um, for, for you guys that have already been with Classic, um, if you are used to Classic, this is um, like data tree. So this updates everything in their history and their, and their data for the district. So a um, lot of times um, people at districts don't have access to this because this can do some damage um, if they don't know what they're doing. So a lot of ITCs don't have this option out there for people, or maybe they just leave it to one or two in the district and let them do the mass changing. But to get this role right here, this doesn't automatically show up. You have to go to system and modules. And then down here, right now it's enabled, but if I wanna install it so the district can't see any of it on any of those core options, then I would click this and then refresh. So now they can't mass change anything, only me at the ITC, because I'll have the administrative uh, administrator role. And now I can just do all the uh, mass changing for them. Okay. But if they want to have certain people at their district do this, they can have that option because what this mass change um, module gives them is group managers and administrators have access to that group manager then. So anybody have those roles, will be able to see that mass change um, procedure. So again, it's up to the ITC. Um, you at the ITC, if you guys wanna let them have that control of changing things in the files. Okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to just kind of go over, um, I have to find one in mass change. Do this here is when you open up that box down here to script. This is where you would find, like, if you need to change an activity date for um, maybe all employees. Like, um, if you said, Oh, let me see if I can do this. Oh, I need to change. You always want to make sure when you're in mass change, you want to make sure you have it broke down to who you want to show and what to change. Because if you don't do this, it's going to change everybody in that, in, in here. So like activity date, I only want to change maybe activity date for this employee. I mean, it's just saying I have like hundreds of them I have to do. Um, what you make sure like for this, for a date and we have it, when you're trying to change a date, we have this date converter that has to be used for any date change. 
And this is what that day converter is. And again, you can find that in our mass change documentation under useful procedure. Oh, no, sorry. No procedures and mass change. So again, um, it just kind of shows you different ones that we have out there for employee payroll item position. Um, we have one certain, which we'll go over when I go through each one. But when you're doing a, uh, a date change, you have to use this script. And again, that's in here in the mass change um, procedures of uh, changing a date. You can't just enter a date and change it. You have to have it in this script. And then you have to just put, put in your date of when you want to change it. So I'll just go ahead and just say this was all those people were supposed to be 12 instead of. So we'll see if we can get her to work here and then execute. How many do I have? Yep, that matches. Nope, didn't work, didn't like it. 2, 12, 22. It may not, I wonder if we may not be able to change activity in attendance, but just for scenario of what I wanted to show you is if any activity dates or any uh, beginning ending dates, you have to use a date converter. So I just wanted to bring that up. So, oh, you know what? Maybe this is why. Let me try it again. Okay, sorry, that's why, because I didn't, you have to have it exactly right. Um, and then it changed it. So you can use that. So this is nice if you need to do a mass change for certain, like a, um, that, a big group and you don't wanna have to do it by editing each one, um, this can save a lot of time, but also it can make a mess for a district if they um, don't do it right. Um, again, you they can create this mass change definition and they can save it. And now it will list under here. So now if they use that change or maybe for some reason they use it, uh, they have to do a change every week for something, um, they can save this and then they can go right back in here, um, load it, enter a new date in or something and save it. Um, if they wanna download that definition and wanna share it with somebody in the district, they can do that by um, doing the download definition. And what's it then saves it as a mass change JSON file. And now they can share that and send that to somebody else in the district and they can use it and they can now import it in here. So then they would click on import and click on that and bring that in. And now they have that option to use that definition whenever they want. Um, if they want to clear that definition and they don't, they need to start over, just click on clear and it switches it and clears it out and they can start over. Okay. Then, all right. I think that's good on the mass change. Again, um, I'll, I'll tell you which ones when we get in there, which, um, options and or core have that mass change option. Okay, so we're gonna go back here, start up here. ACH destination. Okay. So the first one, this is for classic, um, this is similar to the route screen. And this is your baking institution routing numbers. So if you have a new employee that's coming in and you don't have a bank listed under here, you can, this is where you would need to create the new routing number and what bank it is. And then again, if you need to search and say, oh, I don't know, is this, do we already have this um, listed? And then you can just do a search and just typing in the name. Say, oh, we do have North Regional Bank already. So and they have a couple of different routing numbers and you just make sure that that routing number is there. And if not, then that's when you can create, um, you can view it and also under view, you can edit. If you need to edit, maybe edit the name 
edit the routing. Maybe that routing number was entered wrong the first time around. You can correct that by doing that here and then save it. Or we can go directly to edit. Or delete. And I don't think, yeah. And a lot of times when you try to delete something, um, when that brings this error message up is because it is tied already to an employee. So the system is not going to allow you to delete them anymore because uh, they're tied to something and that can um, maybe make a mess of things in the history. So um, if you do try to delete something, um, a lot of times if it's referenced, you cannot delete it. It's, it's there. So there is, that is what your um, ACH destination is for. And again, you do have a mass change in here. So again, if you go down the drop down, you're going to see what is available. There's only two things in the grid, so that's the only thing that's available for mass change. So you can change the description if you need to. If you have 20 northeast regionals, you can change the name of it by using mass change. Okay. The next one is your ACH source. And this is um, going to be similar to your the classic um, um, people that already uh, IITCs that you have used. Uh, that be your DER maintenance, and this is used for when uh, maybe a new uh, district comes in, or uh, the district changes their banks, or creates or HSA. So these will be your payroll and your HSA. So you have your options to create, like I said your payroll ACH, or your health savings account. And what this does then um, is you, this is creates when you're creating your ACH type, tape file to be sent to the bank, this is what this is using. And you will get all this information from the bank. Um, they will send you a sheet and then that's how you tell how to set up each of these um, fields by um, what they give you. And I just show an edit of mine. And here is, I have one and then your ACH transfer code, which is just a number you enter 001. But then again, all this information, routing numbers, destination, um, all this information will be sent to you by the bank. So um, most of the time when banks are coming over from, or districts are coming over from Classic, this information is all set up and it will just be imported in. So nothing really needs to be changed unless the bank contacts and say, oh, something has changed. We want it, um, the file to be uh, changed or um, to be changed, excuse me. And this is where you would do this. So again, this is for your health savings accounts and your payroll ACH transfer. So this is how this is set up for them. Um, again, um, this would be, is only given by default to the group managers. So the group managers are the only ones that can use this or see this. And then if you want somebody else in the payroll to see it, then you can give them the USP manager ACH source permission. And then they would be able to see this also. Okay. The next one is your adjustments. Okay, so your adjustments would be um, things that you maybe you need to adjust, maybe adding SIRS hours, SIRS days, SIRS and um, SIRS and SIRS hours and days, ODGF, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> Maybe you need to adjust OG, ODJFS weeks <clears throat> for an employee. This is what your adjustment journals would be used for. Um, maybe you need to adjust uh, applicable gross for an employee for their federal um, payroll item. Maybe because um, maybe of a refund that was done in a prior fiscal year um, or prior year of fiscal year. This is where this would all be done. So when you create, 
you have the option to create a new one. So if you have many adjustments to do for um, all at one time, um, you have the option to <clears throat> create new. And what that does when you click on employee and select, and you're clicking on like uh, the payroll item, <clears throat> if I need to change a total gross for it. And again, you have to be in, it can't be empty and I believe it has to be an open posting period. And I'm still back in the day there. And then you do your, um, you enter in your mount. If you click on save and you got to do a bunch of entries for one person. So maybe you have to change like, um, all the um, total gross for this employee, but you have to do it for all the payroll items or something. Um, then when you hit create and save, um, it just keeps bringing that employee's name up. But if you don't want to, you click out close. And then actually, if you're creating a new one, <clears throat> Rose, just, I'm just bringing in some things here to try and see how it works. And then you save. Oh. Yeah, sorry. And then it just uh, closes out right away. So these options up here are just if you want to use them. If you don't have any of them, you just click on save. It's just going to save it. And then you have to exit out. So it's just a little short, but save time on that. Um, so again, um, if you need to create an adjustment for an employee, just you can search by drop down, or if you know the employee's uh, name, you can type in first, last, and it brings up that employee. Um, then you have to find, um, if you're adjusting some payroll item, then you can find that. Or if you just need to adjust, uh, say they, their SERS days were off and the um, SERS um, report or the payroll is off by a day or something, um, you can do that right here. And then you put in, make sure you put the, it falls in the beginning and ending date of that payroll in order for it to be picked up on the payroll and I need to add 10, five days for this employee. And again, the months that you can add, if you want it to click to the month to date for the employee, the quarter, their year to date or fiscal, you have that option. And now you added the days for that employee. I think it was Anderson, five days. Okay, so um, some suggestions. Um, I was trying to think of maybe what these two date options, what you would use, maybe different for. And what I came up with was some of them like SERS and SERS retirement dates and hours for reporting. Um, maybe if you're needing to update the days or hours for a payroll, then you would just use maybe the month to date and the fiscal to date, because that's what um, SERS was definitely SERS as a fiscal. Um, so you could just use the month or fiscal, but most of the time, you're always checking um, all of them. So really there is an option. Maybe the only time you're not gonna check um, um, all of them is maybe if you, like I said, void a check that causes years, fiscal or calendar, and they just wanna update the gross for the month or the quarter. They don't want it to um, affect their wages for the year because it was prior and they probably would have to do maybe a W-2 correction on that that is when you maybe would suggest using different options here. Um, maybe adjusting W-2 amounts for employees at the end of the year. Sometimes uh, wages need to be adjusted for some reason. Um, then you could just use the year to date. You unclick everything um, and maybe the quarter if, if you want the balance to be this, a quarter to be same for the W-2. Um, then you would definitely choose um, just your quarter, or excuse me, the year to date, the wrong one. So there's a few um, that maybe 
why you would need to use different um, month to day or the today options. But again, most of the time um, you're going to use all of them. Um, another would be SIRS advanced time. A lot of times if their employees are not matching and they're on the non-advanced um, report or something they need to make them get on the SIRS advanced, then they would wanna use um, the fiscal to date because that's what it's going to be, get them on the report. And then down here, um, then you would click, you know, your stirs days. And then you would unclick everything else. And then that would get that fiscal today updated for the employee. But some of them in here, um, you have your health insurance, which would be for the um, employer, employer um, total health insurance, if they need to do an adjustment. Um, this is where you would add your movie expense. Again, in classic, this was on their federal record on the old one where you would have to go in there and they have a field listed for each one. Now this is where you're gonna find those is under these adjustments. The fringe benefit, life insurance, you have, which is your NC1, your adoption assistance, dependent care, third-party sick pay, your vehicle lease. And then also this is where you can adjust employees total gross on the payroll item actable gross, maybe the amount withheld, the board's amount of the payroll item, which would be anything like Medicare pickup maybe, or, um, or the Medicare um, board paid portion of the Medicare. Um, additional withholdings, maybe the additional withholdings needs to be adjusted. And then also you have, um, these fields are now here for the four, uh, the fiscal to date board amount for retirees. We have those now here. And then also you have your ODGFS total gross and ODGF weeks. And I believe the total gross um, is here because if you don't have employee marked as ODGFS reportable right away, um, in the beginning of their payroll and they run a couple of payrolls, they're gonna to have to do an adjustment and they're gonna to have to use this to get that corrected. And then again, here's your stirs and serves and hours and days. And then the EMIS attendance and EMIS absence, which is for EMIS reporting. And then your board's pickup amount of payroll item. So if this is uh, the employees, maybe full board pickup um, or stirs or stirs or Medicare, um, this is what they would use if they need to make an adjustment on that. Um, the van sick unit uh, leave used, and then also the health reimbursement. And again, we have these all listed under, under our mass change, or excuse me, our adjustments. So again, if you have questions, we have it broke down for each one and what each one does. And what, when you're updating it, it also, we try to put in there, what is it adjusting? Is it adding to it or is it like completely overriding it and putting in a new figure? So again, we have those out there broken down for each one and what each one does and what it updates. So again, um, when you have time, you can read over all that. Um, and it's there for your convenience to use. And we try to detail it out as much as possible for you. Okay, any, any questions on the adjustment part of the course? Trying to think anything else that I missed. Don't think I did. Oh, report, I guess I could explain the report because this is uh, available on each core item. And again, you can create a report what's showing on the grid as is. And you can run it again by any PDF, you can run it Excel, you can run it CSV, and then the adjustment journal. And so if I run it, it's gonna run exactly what shows on my grid. So those columns that are here is what's gonna show in my report. So again, you have um, the option to add to your grid under more. So if you wanna see a little bit more information, the down arrows means when if it's, um, if it's to the right and you click on it, it's gonna open up more underneath it. And here you can select what posting period maybe it fit in. Um, 
what else is in there? Configuration. You can add a code. So it's going to show the payroll item configuration or payroll item code. What is the name of that? So again, you can go in here and add anything to your payroll or to your grid. And right here's my codes that I just added. And those are the payroll item codes. So federal 001, aisle 002, and then the name. And of course, my names are off because it's um, my data isn't real. So, but again, that is just option that you can run a report or add more to your column if you want to see more um, columns in your grid. And then if I want to get rid of these, I can do reset. And what that does is just takes me back to my default grid. So now, you, as you see, those two columns I just added are gone. So it just takes me takes it takes me back to what it was originally from when um, the default part of the grid. Okay. Again, you have the you have the mass change option under here also. So you can change if you made um, a bunch of adjustments and need to change something. That is an option too. Okay, any questions on adjustments for the time being? Okay, the next one is attendance. Okay, so your attendance is uh, like in classic, it's your uh, attendance screen, pretty much. Um, it shows your absence and attendance. Now on here, it's not gonna show your accumulations because that's in a different part that's under leaves now because before in classic, they were all combined together. But here, this is only gonna show any absence or attendance for the employee added. So this would be anything that was imported from a third party software, you know, um, when they're um, running their payroll, this is where this would be imported into. And you can create individually You can add a row or copy a row. You can delete a row. And then when you're choosing to add an attendance for the employee, you can search for the employee. I believe I first, yep. It brings in um, the very first one. And the activity date. I'm just putting in some activities here. What is the length of either the absence or the attendance? It can only be up to one. So I'll just say it's attendance. Is the employee was he daily or hourly? Is it substituting? And then if you do absence. You have the options of calamity day. Was it a dock day, holiday, jury duty, military or other, personal or uh, professional, sick, unknown, or vacation? So you have those options. Again, you can add a subcategory if you know what kind of attendance a day it was for. You want to do a little bit more um, explain, ex explanation on it. You can enter that there. Also, you can enter uh, what is this a certified or classified employee. And also, if you want to put a pay date, maybe you're entering attendance for future payrolls. And this is not supposed to hit till the next payroll. You can add that in. And what that will do will only add that attendance and pick up when it's included, when it's in that pay date. And again, you have the option, if there's a substitute, you can click on the employee that is substituting for that teacher. So again, you can copy that role, row, and then if is 9-2, everything's already there. 9-3, and copy. Or if you just need to add another row, that just gives you a blank row. 
And then if you need to post this attendance directly to future to get paid for employee, so say, maybe say you um, don't have payroll started yet, then you want to post it to future. So that will post a, uh, post it to future, it'll directly post it and you don't have to go into add the attendance, save it, go into pay, payroll payments future, and then add this um, money for this person for teaching for that day, for these three days. You can directly do it right here. So if I click on post future, because I don't have a current post or uh, current uh, payroll started, the only time you can use the post current is if you already have a payroll initialized. So I got to do post future because I don't have a payroll posted yet. But if you don't want to post it to anything, then you just leave no post posting to payroll. If you would like to do the attendance or maybe they're doing something um, that does they're not getting paid for, but they're getting the attendance for, then you would just leave it no posting to payroll. So post to future and then save. Let's see. I already have an activity date, so you will get errors. So you cannot add more than one day for an activity. And that's on my 9-1 for this employee. So I want to move it down to four. There we go. So now I have three records curated. And as you can see, it lists them. Now here, if you have teachers and you don't want them to be a regular, you want this to be a miscellaneous or maybe um, one of these, you have options down here that you can use. You can change them if you want. So maybe this is not a regular pay. Maybe, oh, this teacher is supposed to be a miscellaneous. Because most of the time, if you're paying an employee a con on a contract, and they're already set up with a contract obligation, you usually don't want to add a regular pay type to this because it's going to screw up their contract and it may not pay outright at the end of their contract. Um, so if they're getting paid extra on top of their contract, you always want to use a miscellane miscellaneous pay type because this is above and beyond their contract. So then that's miscellaneous. So I went in here and I'm going to change them to miss. Okay. Um, you have the option, is it a supplemental? You can change that, which just means they'll get paid differently. It's gonna be taxed differently. So is this a supplemental pay, yes or no? And that means if they're yes, then it can be applies annuity to supplemental, or you're gonna apply the annuities for the, um, for the payroll for the employee to regular. So you do have the option. Again, it's just going to tax them differently. Now, a lot of times when a district um, says, why did this taxes, they got taken up so much more than normal. A lot of times this is the first place to look because sometimes they accidentally select these um, supplemental tax options. And this is where they made that mistake. They accidentally clicked that and it, they calculated it different. And that's why they're seeing either way more taxes being taken out like on a federal and state. Um, again, this would be my first uh, place to look. Because they don't, sometimes they don't realize that they accidentally um, clicked that. Um, is this a retire? Yes or no? So you have the option to um, have retirement taken out on this amount. So maybe they uh, like severance pay. I don't believe it's, uh, or vacation pay they don't have retirement taken out. So they have the option to say no. And then again, if they get retire hours on here, again, do they have an effective date of when they want this to take place? Maybe in the future, they're just somebody's getting ahead of their payroll and getting things entered in for the next month or two, they can put that effective date in there. Again, you have your what account it's going to, Again, if you want to change that account, you have that option here by the drop down. And right now they are working on um, where they're going to maybe for each employee. Um, there, it's only going to show what is showing in a payroll accounts as of now, because some right now it's showing um, a bunch of accounts. So you see, this is 199 of them. So they're working on that where it's going to kind of mimic USAS where. Um, in the drop down, you're only going to see what is uh, for the employee. 
uh, only what is listed under the payroll account. So that is still being worked on. But as of now, you still have the option to drop down and pick different accounts. Um, is this employer distribution or leave pro? So your employer distribution would be any, um, they wanna take that account and um, distribute it out um, to a different object code for the employer distribution portion side of it. Um, so should this be included when they run the employer distribution report or yes or no? And again, if your district uses the Leave Pro, so maybe they um, every month they run Leave Pro and that it's taken from their regular payroll account and they move it to a separate um, account for leave. So they so the treasurer can keep track of how many people are taking leave in what um, what um, parts of the district are high in leave. So they can send those to a different count numbers and then they can keep track. That pulls it out of their regular pay account and it moves it to another pay account um, directly, strictly for leave. Again, not all districts use that, but that's an option there for them. Okay, so I have everything set up correctly how I want it to be set. And then now I'm going to either, you can cancel out, say, oops, nope, I don't wanna do that. Completely wrong, you can cancel out or you can post it. And now it says repost it to future. So now you see, um, oh shoot, who is my employees? Right here, right, attendance right here, Hearst, I think it was. So now you see the employees attendance. Now, if I go to payroll, payroll payments future, should see my Hearst, right there he is. So now, once I get all my future in, like I said, back here in home, you can run this future pay report and make sure you have everybody listed in there. If you wanted to lift, run that. Let's try it and see if I can run it. Yep, and there's my, my total. So it matches what I have in there, okay? Okay, so that's your, uh, your attendance. Okay. Again, you have the option to view it, edit, or delete it. Um, payrolls that are imported from Classic, um, I believe you're not able to delete them as of right now. So you would just have to do a negative to back it out if it needs a correction on it. Excuse me. So the ones that you see that you cannot delete and maybe you need to correct that, you would have to do um, a negative. And once you hover over, it says cannot delete absence that has been applied to latest balance. So again, it'll let you know if you can edit or delete it. Okay, next thing is mass add. This is just a quicker way if a sub teacher comes in and gives a timesheet and we know that she's worked um, certain days or there was absence for um, four or five days, you can do that here. And you don't have to do it individually. So again, you have your options to certify or classify, enter a subcategory if you want. Is it connected to a pay date that's coming up? Is it a substitute? You also have to include weekends. So you can show weekends. Maybe they do a lot of Saturdays for track. You can include those weekends in there so they get paid. So this employee, I'm gonna say, worked from 03 to 07, 22 and worked that Saturday and create. Now this employee has um, dates for, should, you know, we'll have to, I cleared, but usually it stays on there. Um, I don't know why it moved, let me see. Oh, it was there, it just goes directly on there. I thought it, stuck, it stayed on there until I got out, but it just, it clears those boxes out. But that's what it does. It automatically puts them in there for you. Um, but say you, again, 
If you want to add absences, I don't know if this play is sick days, but again, you can do that. You can add um, and you can also do posting period. There it goes. So you can see the white. And then if there was absent or um, attendance days, again, just like you did when you're creating it individually in attendance, um, you can do it post to current or post to future. Let's see. And since they're absent, since they don't go over to future because you're not getting paid for them. Um, but if it was at attendance, then it would. But here you can see they automatically did a mass ad just like that. So it saves the district time by doing that. And again, they have a mass change is available under there. If they need to make some corrections or something, they can use this mass change. Okay. Any questions on attendance? Oh, check. Oh, yes. Thank you. Sorry. Hopefully she wasn't waiting long. Thank you, Carol. And you, have a, you have a chat. All right. Okay. So Alyssa, I think you're you're back in. Okay. Thank you for letting me know, Carol. Okay. Any questions? Andrew, on you have, you have, what? There's a chat. Oh, never mind. Maybe you got it. Yeah, she just wanted me to let her in. Alyssa. Oh, well, she should be back in, I think. Okay. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we went through mass ad. And Okay. The next one would be our bank account. Our bank account is for, um, usually districts only have one bank account, but maybe they have two. Maybe they have, you know, certain checks come out of one payroll uh, account and maybe another one, um, payee checks. <laughs> I don't know why they would have two, but um, if your, if your district does have two, this is where they would set up that bank account. So your bank one, bank two, bank three, but most districts are always gonna have one bank. So it's gonna show what the, the name of your bank is. Um, you can enter a start and stop date of how long you wanna use this bank or you just leave that, um, leave it blank. Okay. All right. So that's just all what the bank account is for. Um, again, the green highlight means it's the one that's uh, the primary one that is being used right now. So if I create another one, bank two, plus bank, and save, as you can see, it's not highlighted because the green one is my bank account that I am using. So if I change it to this one, then the green is down there, and then I know I am using this bank account. So it's just kind of for the eye to catch first. Um, when you're processing payments, this is what that uh, default bank account is looking at. Um, so when you're in like processing payments and payroll, um, like if I select one to print, Right there. Oh, excuse me. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Where was that? Oh, no, it's when you're processing. Sorry. So it'll be under payroll. Right. Yeah. So when you're under there, you know, when you're process payments, right there, default bank account. That's where that is being pulled from. You can see my test bank too. So that's what that bank account is looking at. Any questions on the bank account? Okay, next one would be our compensations. Okay, so this is similar to your job screen in Classic. Um, you would have, um, let's see. 
see the compensation would be how you define um, how the position is going to be paid. Um, it kind of goes in alphabetical order right now, but before you create a compensation, you always have to have a position created first. So just want to put that out there that you would have to create the position first, then the compensation. So, um, so first you would have your compensation and then a compensation um, defines how a position is going to be paid. Um, again, you can create a compensation for each position that you created. So you can have position one and a compensation for one, position two and a compensation for two. And then once you create the compensation, position, compensation, and then the payroll accounts can be added. So the compensation first. Um, so the contract for employees under all compensations, this lists everybody. Everybody in the district that has a non-contract or a contract compensation. Under contract compensation is the, um, is employees that are have specific amount that is paid every pay. So they get paid regardless of how many days are in the pay period. Um, it will always look at their pay per period and they probably are equal pays and, um, and then they get that pay amount um, every pay, doesn't matter. Now, if you're doing non-contract, this would be like your subs, um, sub teachers, part-time employees, Anyone that's not on maybe a uh, schedule with days, this is what you would use for your non uh, setup for these employees would be non contract employees because they're unknown of what work days they're going to work through that pay period. And they don't know what their total amount of their contract will be. So this would be your non contract and these would be people that would need their attendance added. Um, every pay so you can add their attendance and post it directly to future or current and pay them. So to create a compensation for an employee, um, the employee would have to be added first and then you go in and select, find your employee. Um, what position am I creating it for? And then I have a new contract. Oh, that's a non-contract, so we don't want that. Let me find one that's a contract first. Oh, um, let's do Hearst. I don't know why it's not letting me. Andrea, you're on the non-contract tab. Go am to I? the contract Oh, tab. I am. Oh my gosh. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. I go, why is you're it welcome. not keep showing up? Okay, see very easily how that can happen. Thank you, because I'm getting frustrated. I was like, why is it not working? Abby, why? I thought I was under all compensation. Okay, that looks better. So now I'm an employee, and you want to uh, uh, find the employee that you need to create the compensation for, find the position that you're creating the new compensation for, and now it shows this contract. Okay, so here is our contract. So now, um, the fields that need to be added. So um, the code field is your first one. Now this is a code field that is used by mass load. If you need or uh, changing um, information on a contract for employee, this is what uh, mass load is using now. So a code um, has to be created for it. So again, if you're creating a new employee, um, you can just enter, um, this is A, this is their first contract compensation, they can do an A but it has to be a specific to that contract. Not one contract um, can be the same. Um, so if each position has its own um, contract code attached to it. So if you're manually creating a contract, you have to enter one in. If you're in new contract and, up and creating new contracts for the employees, then a code will be um, assigned to it you don't have to enter one in. And then when you import those contracts over into the con to the con employee's contracts, it will automatically update that code for you. Same thing goes for the non-contract. When you're creating a non-contract, you have to add a code um, manually in there for, um, for the employee. 
Okay. Um, if you want to do, you can do. Um, I think I think you can do like a fiscal twenty two. I think. I don't know if it's going to like that. Yeah. So if you want to update and say this is our fiscal year on twenty two, so you know, um, you can put that code in there like that. So that is always required. Now your job calendar um, for employees that are going to need to be on a contract with days, you want to make sure they have um, select their um, a calendar with days. And because this is very important for the contract days and contract work days, or excuse me, the contract work days to be calculated correctly. Um, so job calendar start and stop day one to make sure they have that inputted, in, inputted in there. Again, um, put in what the description of that employee is. It's a secretary, teacher, um, history teacher. You can put that in their description. Or you can do a description of this is their fiscal year um, 2022 teacher. So you know um, when you're looking on the grid that you can see all the employees' uh, contracts are for the new contract for the fiscal year. The label is used for your um, description on your pay stubs. So whatever you put here um, is going to show on your pay stubs, unless you put in, a I believe you put a description when you're paying an employee on the future current, it's gonna use that as their description. Otherwise, it's gonna look at this label. I'm just gonna put this gear 22 in there. So very important is your next contract compensation. Again, this is important for your work days to be um, calculated correctly with your job calendar. So I'm just going to put in 21 to 630, 22. What pay plan? Um, is this district biweekly, semi-monthly, or monthly? So it just depends what your district is. I believe my test account is biweekly. Pay unit. Is it daily or hourly? Is the, or is the employee a daily employee or an hourly employee? Usually if they're on a stretch paid like this and they're paid on calendar, they're usually um, a daily employee. Hourly would probably be your subs that are on time sheets. Unit amount. Um, the unit amount will be, um, I believe it would be calculated. So we'll see if that works there. Retire hours. Um, you can enter in what, how many hours does this um, person get paid? The SRS advance field, this is only if they're in advance. Will that be checked? So that won't be clicked until they run their SRS advance and actual, and then that will be checked so that way you know when the employee is in advance over the summer months. Here is if this contract is a um, going to be applied to annuities to supplemental to be tax surflate or regular, they can select that. Um, most of the time it is none. But if they're creating a contract for a a big payout or something, and they want it to be taxed differently, they can create a contract, a compensation, and then they can supplemental tax option, they can select one of those. The unit amount is, um, excuse me, archived. Um, you have the option to archive this um, employee if they don't want it to show in the grid because um, the grid can get pretty long in the compensation. So if the contract, they're done with that contract, is that past the school year contract, they can go in here and archive these and they won't show anymore. But you can see them when you click in the grid and show archived accounts. So they're still there, they're just hidden. Um, contract days work, that will be calculated, or that would be when you run your first payroll, that will start adding days on. Contract work days will adjust once we run um, the save. Hours and day. This person works seven and a half hours a day. And yes, this is their primary compensation. Um, actually, you can't click it on here. We'll have to click it on the other side, but that box just means um, the you can sister can see if this um, out of the five contracts or something, this is their primary compensation that they're using. The paper period will be calculated, the contract amount. Again, you can enter in a contract type. That's um, just an optional thing. It pays in contract. Six, I believe. 
And then the retro next pay, that would be only if maybe if you're doing a next uh, new, uh, new contract mid-year change, um, that this, this is what this figure would be used for for this box. So it knows to pick up that amount for the next pay. This employee, a stretch pay just means, are they gonna equally get paid whatever the pay per period calculates, that's the pay per period, they're gonna get paid every pay till the end. The accrued wages, amount earned, amount paid, amount docked and pays paid, this gets updated every payroll. These are non-modifiable um, fields. Salary schedule um, for districts that keep uh, track of their salary schedule for, uh, dis for employees. This is where they would add this. What uh, schedule are they on? Um, their schedule ID or in this um, salary schedule step. So again, they can um, use that to keep track of their, um, their steps and they probably would change that every fiscal year. And they have to do that by a mass load and update that. Um, is this reportable to EMIS? So most of the time teachers, anybody that works with students, they're reported to EMIS. Uh, so they get included in the CIF, uh, data collection um, in the reporting period L, I believe. Um, local contract code, that is only used, that is non-modifiable, and I believe that is used for the EMIS um, portion of it. The historical context calendar start date, you always want to have a, a calendar start date on there. Um, so my, I was just gonna put it starts in the beginning of calendar of uh, August. So usually that'd be probably your first day of, of when they work on their calendar work days. Um, they can enter a calendar stop date now or they can wait and enter it at the end um, of their contract. But if they know when their um, end of their contract is, they can enter that in. Um, a lot of times they wait until the very end to enter uh, contract stop date when it's done. These two fields, um, oh, getting ahead of myself here. There we go. These fields here, um, these are only show when you're doing a mid year contract change or a new contract. So when you import a new contract over or activate it into your new contract for the employee, this will show that this is where it came from. Oh, it came over from, um, they did a mid-year contract change spread over remaining pays. So it will show in here so you can tell, oh, this wasn't their original contract. They actually had a mid-year contract change and it'll show which type it was. So it's just a history of what this uh, contract was. So right now it shows nothing because it's a new contract. Um, but again, if you did a new contract change or a new contract, it will show here that that's what it was prior. So it just keeps like a running running total of what, what it was changed. The pay group, um, the pay group is already set. Um, that came over from the position because this comp or this position has already has a position number assigned to it. So the, my pay group code is one and the pay group description is uh, Wisteria two. So again, that comes from the position. And again, when I showed you that the create compensations, this is just um, if you need to make an adjustment to once you're getting into the payroll and you're paying and you notice that sometimes your crude wages gets worked up a little bit, um, the, amount earning, the amount earned is wrong because of a dock or something, um, you can use this to adjust the amount earned or the uh, crude wages. And then again, maybe the days worked uh, at the end of the, maybe for STRS advance, if their days are not wrong because they're on the non-advance report and they need to get them advance, they can do this to make their days equal and save it. And then they'll be on the advance report. So that's kind of what you use for um, the compensation journal, just to make adjustments within their compensation. Okay. So if I save that, if everything works accordingly, it did. So now you see it updated my unit amount, added my pay per period, created my contract work days for me. So everything is in there. Now, a new feature that has been added on several of the options in core is the audit report. And you can see as soon as you created this, 
You can generate the reports directly from here, save it, and look at it. So now you can just pick up that report and now you can go through, if you have a checklist that you entered using entering for that employee, you can go through and make sure all your values are in for that employee. And it shows all the adding modifications for that compensation that you've done in, in redesign um, within that time frame that you entered. So this is gonna be nice. And again, uh, this is gonna be on most of the new um, options under core. Once you, but first you have to create a new one or modify it and save it, then you get that audit report option. It's just not there. Um, if you go in and edit it and you're looking at it, it's not going to be there until you actually make modifications and save it. Okay. Okay. So we created that. Um, same thing goes for non contract. I guess I have to speed it up a little bit because I'm running, I'm going a little slower than what I thought. And I don't want to miss anything for you guys. Um, the next thing is the same thing is for your create compensations. Again, this is for employees that are subs and non-contract. So you're creating a new non-contract for an employee. Again, the position has already been created. So it's picking up that one position. But if you have a whole new position created, then you can select that position and add it. So again, it needs to have a code that's directly for that position compensation. Um, usually these are default calendars because these are employees that you don't know what days are going to work. So usually they're on a default calendar. The description, again, the label for what the pay stub will be. Um, usually for, the, for these type of, um, they don't have a um, start date on it, but you can enter a start date if you like, because they're not looking at a job calendar. Is it biweekly, monthly? What kind of pay unit? Usually sometimes these are hourly employees because they work, or maybe if the district has everybody as daily and they just get paid a daily rate for subbing or something. Um, again, um, just depends how the district sets up their subs. Uh, what the unit amount is, they get paid $50 an hour for subbing. Um, at least enter uh, retirement hours as one because they can always adjust that at the end when they're entering the employee in attendance or in up to Cal, they can make sure they get their correct retirement hours in. Um, hours per day. You can enter in if they if you know what this employee is going to add. I just add a one for now and then that can always be adjusted when you're adding that employee in um, up to Cal. I'm going up to Cal. Uh, if you are sure, uh, current, I'm using classic terms. Again, that would be all. Um, if they get paid a regular, it will update here. But if they get paid miscellaneous, right now we don't have a place where you can see the miscellaneous um, pay, pay amounts. So you won't see that on here because these are only for regular. Will these get updated here? Again, um, you can enter a calendar start date if you like. And then again, the pay group gets updated directly from the position. And again, you have your uh, compensation adjustments that you can do. And again, report to EMIS. If this is a sub for teaching, they get reported to EMIS. Okay. So that's how you create a non-contract for your uh, employees. Again, you have your report options, you have your more, and you have your match change. Any questions on the compensations? Okay, I guess I did one thing I wanted to show. Let me get to a, it's a calculate and save button. This is something that has just been added. I don't know why that's past that, let me see. Okay, so my test employee in here. Now you see when I go back in there, I see a calculate button before I didn't see that. So when you go back in there and edit and you got to make a change, say, oh, he was on the wrong um, calendar or something. You can change that and do a calculate. I have to... Yeah. So then it shows zero days because now it's not on a contract or on the calendar. I had to wipe it out first, but it did work. Um, but for now, I want to keep it to that. So if I calculate again, it changed my work days. 
um, maybe my uh, contract obligation was wrong. Like, oh, geez, how did I miss that? Now, if I just click save, all it does is save the, 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 my update. It did not change my paper period at all or my unit amount. So you got to be really careful with that. Um, if you want it to count, then you have to calculate it in order for it to update. Now you can see I updated. So you can calculate as many times when you're in here to get it to, if you need something changed, um, you can do that. Maybe the hours of days have gone down. And you want to calculate that. Let's see. No, oh, changed. I thought it would change on me, but it didn't. But you can yeah, change. It's, it's set up as daily, Andrew. I think if you had it as. Oh, Allery. Yep, yeah, you're right. There you go. Yeah, that's why it didn't change because you're going to get paid regardless because your stretch pay is going to be daily the same thing. But if, like for the hourly, um, it's going to now it's going to change. So just remember, if you're doing calculation changes, to make sure you calculate before you save, because if you save, all it's going to do is just save what you just entered in. It's not going to change anything. So I'll go back to my, my daily and save, and then you save it. So that is a new feature that was added on um, that you can go in there and either make changes. If you don't want it to calculate, then you just save it. Um, or if you wanted to recalculate, then you have to make sure you click that calculate button and save. So that was just another thing I wanted to add in there. Okay, um, anything on compensations? Um, right here in the grid here, again, you can view, edit. Um, you cannot delete compensations, you can only archive them. So if I go in and archive, click archive, it may say delete, but you're not deleting them. They're just being archived. But now if I go in there, include archive at the top, it just brought him back. If I on click it, then it disappears. Now, if you want to bring that employee back to archive, on archive, excuse me, you have to go in and edit it. Where is my employee that I archived? There it is. Unclick it and save it. And now the employee is back showing on the grid as non archive. And then if you want to make, um, I just created that compensation. Um, so if you want to clear the compensation primary flag, you can do that. But this is how you uh, make that compensation the primary. So if you just want it to stand out more in the grid and you want to make those primary, um, then you can see which ones are being used. If you don't have them archived or something, I guess you can use that and use this primary um, flag right here. Okay, I think we're good there. Um, moving on to date codes. I better get moving here. I'm talking too much and descri or description too much. Um, this next one is uh, the date codes, um, the employee. This is used for the employee, which is right down here. Um, if you wanna add fields to the employee fields, you would do, um, you can create um, fields for them. So date S field. And then your property name would be so if I created that. Now if I go over down to employees, which we haven't been to yet, as you can see the other ones, fingerprinting and such like that. Right down here. Employee date CF. So these are the ones that I just created. So whatever you're creating that date codes is going to go down here in the on the employee portion. And it gives you where you can enter your date. So maybe they've got to do their fingerprinting. Um, and then they can add a description of the fingerprinting. 
Um, so you have your date and then a text field that you can enter in. So that is what your date code fields is um, used for and where they will show up. Again, this is for district use. They can add fields to their um, to the employee. If they keep track of certain things, they can create um, whatever they want and they will show right down here. They can create as many as they want on that. Okay, so that was the date codes. Uh, the EMI entry, this is um, considerable to in classic the USPS web. So if you do the web, um, you're used to that in classic. Um, this is for the EMIS reporting. So the EMIS employee and position, once the position is created for the employee, it automatically gets sent here. And if it once the employee is created, it gets automatically sent here. So this is just, you cannot, um, I as administrator can edit the screen. Um, again, you can have your certain roles for certain people in the district. Maybe they're just EMIS reporting and that's all they deal with. Then they can have the EMIS roles and all they'll see is this EMIS screen here and maybe a few other for reports and such. Um, but as administrator, I, I can see this and I can edit. And all that information is, is from the employee screen brought over. Again, you can update the information. Once you update it here, it will also change it on the employee side, on the employee screen. Same thing for the position. Once the position has been created for the employee, which is down here, then you'll be able to see the EMIS position. And that information comes directly over from the position. And again, you can upgrade, uh, make changes here if need be, and save. And again, that will change it on the position side of it also. Now, if you want to see um, the CJ and CC um, modules, these don't show up automatically. This is something that needs to be added under the modules, or is that configuration? Oh, right here, EMIS. So since this, isn't, um, enable, this is, um, I have it checked, um, I'm able to see those. Now, if I click those and took those off, you will not be able to see those. Oh, you see the CC. It, it only it only affects the contractor records. The CCs are always out there. Oh, let's see. I thought it was both. Sorry. I, for some reason, I was it's thinking okay. it was CC yep. and CJ. <laughs> for some reason. All right. Okay, so I got them back there. So um, I was thinking it was for CJ and CC. So it was just the CJ that gets brought out there. So now it shows the CJ record now. So when you go here, now they uh, districts can create their CJ records for their EMIS contractors. And you just create, select the employee um, that they have, because I have to have the employee created in a position at least. And then the compensation, and then they enter the IRN position code and FTE. And then once they have that uh, information entered, they can click the extract CJ. And then they have to send this to this uh, data collector um, during uh, EMIS reporting. So just make sure that's all information. And again, same thing for their CC um, records. If they have contractor um, or EMIS contracted service employees, um, they wanna make sure they create that record for the employee. Um, so they have federal tax ID, position code, funding source, the local contract, contractor name, hours per week based on service, based on hours based on people, and then the start and stop date and the rate. And you wanna make sure you have reportable to EMIS or it will not get picked up in the extract file. 
So I have one out there. And let's see if we can create extract. Yep. And then there's my extract, which I would send on. Any questions on the EMIS portion? Um, the next thing would be, there we go, templates or, uh, okay. Um, I moved, um, now we're going into the employee portion and the employee would be the, if you have a new employee coming in, now you need to create the employee port for the, um, for the, this would be your first step in creating the new employee. So first I was click on save and you do have an option for templates. Um, what that means is you can create an employee, um, maybe all your employees live in one town and, or live in Ohio, and you just want to enter in as much information as you possibly can. So maybe you create one for all the single people, maybe for all the married people, um, maybe for all the females. You have an option um, to select up all the information that you want to and that way it's all ready to go. For when that employee comes in. So if I click some information, add some information and I'm gonna save this template and I just, um, and, uh, single, I just call it single, just trying to make up something here. So now when the employee comes in and they have these all broken down. Um, they can they can save it any way they want. It's just I'm trying to think of somehow to save a record. Um, all these people um, that are single um, have an option to create um, employee record right away. Um, all they would have to do is go in and and choose the template, and that all magically comes in, and they can go in and start typing in the remainder and save. It's just it's just a saving feature. And again, they can add up to anything in that and save it on there um, that they want. Now, if they want to go back to default, they can go back to the default. But again, it's just an option. So if I entered, um, I'm just going to go ahead and enter myself in. So you want to enter your employee number. Now your employee number um, that can be um, either you have that set as um, automatically you manually enter it each time, or if you don't, um, you can update that on the configuration and you can select it for the computer to automatically um, bring in your um, employee number. And I think I have it set up to be that way, so we'll see if it works. So you don't have to type it in. And again, that's under the configuration for that to be assigned. Okay. So then the next one would be enter in the full name. Um, if the legal name is different than what the employee's name is up here, they would need to put that in here. So that way the W-2 picks it up. If this is not filled in, then the W-2 will look at the name here. The street, um, first street. And then you enter in, of course, that came in automatically. And then if you have a foreign address, province or country, you can enter in, that's optional. Then you have your work number. You have your home number. Again, you can put as the home phone is unlisted. Um, primary email address. You would definitely want to have this if you're doing email direct deposit notices. And 
If you have maybe a secondary email, so you have two email addresses, maybe one's for personal, one is their um, work, and they want the, um, the addresses for both. Um, when you're getting email address uh, addresses, it will send to both. Um, marital status is it's like again, single, married, or unstated. Um, here is where if you if the employee leaves the district, you can um, archive, archive that employee and it will not show in the grid anymore. Um, is this employee eligible retirement? Um, I just started, so I am not eligible yet. Uh, email direct deposit notice was already checked because of my default that I set up. Um, is it a female or male? Um, new hire reported. That will get checked once the new hire is reported to OG, ODJFS. The ODJFS reportable, you'll want to check that if they're ODJS reportable. Do they have an OSDI code? You can enter that in here in the OSDI code. And that is used for EMIS reporting purposes. Um, it's employee per time. So if this employee is a part-time employee, only works three, two, three days a week, you want to make sure you do part-time employee. Is re employee reportable to EMIS? Again, those would be anybody that works directly with students. And again, you can enter a spouse name and or you can enter um, if this is a sub, you can enter in, um, she subs, but she only subs for Mondays and Fridays. They can enter that in there so if they can go in and look at these employees and say, okay, this employee only works those sub days. Um, birth date. Hire date, so the date the employee actually started. Um, the last paid date, this will get updated every time they're paid. The ODJF hire date is always the same of your hire date. And again, the termination date would only be entered when the employee is done working in the district. Would that be entered? They can enter in, if they keep track of when their last evaluations are, they can update those every time or when their next one would be. The experience. So this would be for your teachers or your um, principals, um, military, um, do they work authorized experience? How many years? Uh, district experience directly um, in the building. They can keep track of all this um, information for EMIS reporting. So pretty much, I think the total experience, I think authorized experience is uh, uh, important and also your principal experience is what they want to know. So that would have to be updated every year. Uh, primary race, um, you have to just pick out which, uh, what their race is. Are they American, Indian, Alaska, Native, Asian, Black, Hispanic, or Latino? These two have to be filled out either um, with the three known there and then um, before it won't save otherwise. So those two fields for sure um, in the white. Um, again, these are for district use. And again, for the standard payroll check distribution, if they want to, when they're running their checks, they can use this check distribution and um, it will print out um, when they select um, by employee name check distribution and it will print out um, the checks in order of the, the distributions. Uh, Jamie, the three experiences, I believe, would be your authorized experience, your principal experience for the principals, of course, and I believe total experience. I believe those are the three that are, are used majority. Now, again, they can use these other ones if they like. You're welcome. Okay. Again, standard personnel is for district use. The state reporting, again, they would use this for, oh, went too far. So they would um, have to um, select what their uh, degree is. 
what degree type, where they're at. Do they have a handicap status, long-term illness? And the long-term illness gets filled in right before reporting period for EMIS for long-term. And um, that should match what they have in their attendance for absences. And then non-certificate employee ID. Uh, the non-certificate employee will be with their ZID number and that will get entered when they create their, when they run their employee through the SIF data collector and then that will get updated. Other credentials and then they can enter semester hours. So the non-credential is your ZID employees that don't have a degree. The credential ID would be if your teachers have a, a, a degree, then they would enter in what that credential ID is here. So it gets picked up in the MIS. Okay, then these get updated every time they um, run payroll. So again, if they want to keep track of what this position has been paid on so far, they can do that by going here. Okay. And then if I miss a field, it will let me know. And again, you have that audit purpose so I can run an audit just for what I just ran and make sure I filled in everything and nothing is missing. Okay. Um, Long-term illness, um, that usually is where if you have um, the long-term illness, where did I say that from here? Right here. These days you have to make sure that enters your long-term illness for the, um, that matches what shows on attendance. So your attendance absence is here. And then that, just gotta think here. There it is. Okay, long-term illness. So this field, then that number of days missed, um, if they miss greater than three weeks or one continuous absence, they have to enter in those total days on that um, long-term illness so they can um, create a report, maybe just for that employee using absences. And then they have to count their days of continuous absence because um, they do report that to EMIS. And that's where that would be entered here on that EMIS um, long-term illness down here. And then once they're done with that, um, they will have to just clear that out at the end of the fiscal year before, before the new fiscal year starts after, after they reported. Because they don't want to report that same amount for the next year if they didn't um, miss that many days. So, okay. Um, any other questions on the employee of adding? And the one thing I did want to mention on that, under the mass change, when they do have to clear that out, they do have that right here, clear employee long-term illness. So that's already in a mass change procedure for them. So they can clear that out after they um, uh, sent that in for their June reporting. Once that is done, they can go in and clear that out for the new fiscal year. And also under mass change, we have the change archive flag. And we also have the change email direct deposit flag. So there is three um, definitions that are there already from the SSC for the districts to use. Okay. The next thing is employee personnel. Go back to my PowerPoint here. Okay. 
Okay. And also I wanted to mention also on our employee, um, if you uh, archive an employee record, um, what that does, it, it archives it from all options. So you won't see that employee listed anywhere, anywhere under any of these, unless you include the um, archived um, in, on the top. So like um, for the compensation, it would hide it from the compensation too, unless you include archived employees. That's the only way you're gonna see that employee anymore. So I just wanna bring that up for the employee portion of archiving. It hides it all together. The employee personnel screen, that one is once you collate, create the employee, then the employee is now over on, um, gets directly sent to this personnel. And this is uh, people that can view or edit this would be employees, uh, they would need the personnel user role, but most of the time, probably most employees will see it. I'm admin, so I see it. Um, again, you can only view, you can't delete it or anything. So you can view or edit. So probably people that work with EMIS can go in here and make corrections if they need to, to the data or reporting. Okay. Uh, job calendar. Uh, again, for the classic people, this would be for your cal maintenance, calendar maintenance option. And any calendars that have already um, have job um, days um, already tied to them to a record, to a tied to a pay record, you can never delete them. So, um, but you can um, archive them. If you don't use them anymore, um, you can archive them. Okay. So, you can create it. So if you're creating a new calendar for maybe um, there's a new employee and he's totally on his own, you can actually create a rec, uh, job calendar directly for him by, by one. And then you can um, let me just do a test. And then you can enter and the dates for this, maybe this employee only works um, certain days or something, um, you can create that uh, calendar for them. I'm just gonna create it at the end of the month, I guess. Um, you, so if I do, you, again, you can include weekends. So if you want the work days to be included on those weekends, if you have this checked, it will automatically include that in there. Um, you have the option to, um, to create a holiday, clamor day, makeup day, or none, or the work day, which is most what you're going to use. And if we do a mass add, it automatically adds it for you. So then if I go in there and say, oh, I forgot that Monday. is a holiday, I can go in there and just change that to a holiday then. Or I can click on it, right click, and I can change it. So you either do it by up here, or you can just do it by right clicking in the field and putting in your, what the holiday type is or the type of um, day it is. Um, right here, this day count, um, you can, if you're running reports, uh, job calendars, and you want to make sure maybe you're running it for an employee, you got to figure out why his days are off, you can, you can type in a custom report range. And if you put in a date range, and since this is new, I'm not going to have, so it's still, it's just going to show what my date range is. Custom date range would be right down here. Your fiscal will always be your fiscal. So it's looking beginning of fiscal year to end, your calendar year from January to end of December. Your, what is, how many days is in the first quarter? Because I'm in my first quarter, um, first quarter of 2022. Um, so you can see what many um, days are listed on the calendar for that. And what I have listed right now up on here. So March, so if I change it, it goes to April. 
And then it changed April, changed to second quarter. So it just changes with what you're in. And it changes to third. I use this a lot if I'm trying to figure out a compensation and uh, the days seem off or something, I um, find their calendar and I uh, go in there and just do a search and put a custom date range in and it brings up what um, how many days is showing as W's and holidays on it. And then I can see if maybe they missed a day or something. But that's how you create a calendar. Um, and again, you can go for um, beginning of the fiscal year to the end of the year of uh, fiscal year and create a calendar and put the W's on there. And then you would have to go in there individually and maybe change the holidays off um, like Christmas, if that falls during the week or something, you might have to go in there and just change a day. Okay. Um, the next thing would be the mass change. Um, again, if you create your calendars um, for the upcoming year, or maybe you have a calamity day on uh, the middle of winter, um, miss school. Um, you can go in and take that date, whatever date that was in February. And you need to update it to a calamity day. You can take all your, not your defaults, of course, and, and take that date and update it. So now when I go to 2 1, let me go back. Right there. And they changed all the days from work day to a calamity day. It just takes a little time um, so they can change it. If they missed a, they missed a holiday when they were creating calendars, um, they can act, act, actually use that to change, um, to update that to uh, all the calendars for that holiday. Um, this would probably be your biggest one that districts will want to use when they're creating their calendars for the upcoming year. They can just take the calendars from the prior years and move them over to the new start and stop dates. And then they go in and use that mass change to change, like maybe the holidays fall on a different day, um, things like that. So this would save them time because they can just use these uh, calendars from prior years. And then I think, let's see if that works for me. And you. I'll just do a few months. Let's see what you use. You can copy them over. So then those copied over into, and I don't remember what I selected. I think it was one of these. Is that one? I wish there was a way I could. Uh, so which report I just did. AFG, I'm pretty sure I did. Huh. Maybe it's back here. Where were I didn't show? Hmm. Maybe I didn't select the right one. Oh, I think I know why. Because I didn't have days on it. So of course it's not going to copy. So there we go. There we go. Now oh, I did. That's why. Because these are older calendars. So the calendar that I had from the prior, from that um, one calendar that I copied over from the IIG, and I used that calendar. So you can create one calendar for everything and then use the start and stop date to create them for the next year. And then you just have to modify them a little bit and tweak them. Um, you might have to do that for a couple of different calendars because not every district, you know, every everybody, because you have your teacher's calendar and you might have um, your secretary's calendar. So um, you might have to copy those, um, your teacher calendars from last year to the new one. And then you do your secretary's copy of the secretary's calendar to the new year. And then, like I said, do the mass change um, and then just do the um, modifications of maybe the holidays changed. So a little work is still need to be done, but it's it's easier just to use the copy function and just copy them from to the next year. 
Any questions on the calendar? Okay. Uh, leaves. Is um, this is how you would create your employees' uh, personal sick or vacation um, records? So if you click on edit, the ones for employees that are there, this employee is eligible only for sick and personal. And that comes from actually the position screen, what they're eligible for. So down here, if we go back to Brent Hurst and we look on him, I believe it's. Thing. Yeah, right here, eligible flags. So if I want him to have vacation now, so now he has all three. So if you click on one edit, if you're just trying to edit like sick or something, it's going to open all three boxes. So if whatever they're eligible for, they're going to show here. So now you have um, the employees um, show their sick, personal, and vacation. So adding one, if I added one, I don't think I have an employee out there that's new yet, so I can't click and create one. So I'm just going to pretend when you create, it will bring up all those three boxes. So then what you have to do is you're going to want to enter the acume per month. The sick, if you accumulate per month means you're going to, whatever they get um, per month when they do the benefit um, accrual, um, this is how many days they're going to get during their accrual, 1.25 days. Is it leave you in an hourly or daily? Max leave amount. Um, you want to make sure you have a max leave amount if you're doing accrual. That's very important. Um, and then the reset value. And the reset value, um, that would only be for your personal because that they re, um, reset your personal every um, high fiscal year for the new coming year and they reset them back to three. Um, so the reset for uh, vacation and um, sick would be, be left blank. Um, balance, um, once you give them their accrual days, it will start adding the days here, or it will be minus once they use, start using absences. So this will show their balances. Um, the cumulative based on hours. Now, if your employee is an hour, hourly employee and they are being, um, they get that part-time sick leave um, where they can uh, um, give them 4.5, hours a month um, for every 80 hours or 4.5 hours um, when they hit their 80 hour mark of working. Um, this is what the accumulate base hour on hours is used for. And then that goes in with the current service down here. So you would need to have the accumulate based on hours. And this is only for part-time employees, hour, hourly employees and then the uh, current service hours. And then they would accumulate the 4.5 every, um, every pay, or 4.6, excuse me. So up to 80 hours, then when they run their part-time accrual, the system knows to look at their current service hours, and then it will um, do the 4.6 here. And then um, once they, um, every time they run a payroll, this would be uh, added of their hours. Every time they run a payroll, it will keep track of their hours and keep adding it onto um, this current service hours. And then the service hours accumulator would be 4.6 here. And then once they run the service accumulator or um, part-time accumulator, it will subtract off the 80 hours of this current service here. And, and say, um, then they get a 4.6 added on to their balance. Um, any fields in the blue um, are non-modifiable. Those are only used when the, the district is um, 
running payroll or running sick leave or for the districts. Um, the personnel, um, a cum per month. Usually they don't have a cum per month because it's not accumulated. The max leave amount. The max leave amount would be from, um, they won't have a max amount because they don't have a max, and the recent value will always be three. And then their balance. So once they use up their three days, and they um, gave them the three days in accumulation, uh, which show three days, and then uh, it would be every time they use one person day, it will take off the balance. Um, if they have an attendance and it has not been ran through the pay stub yet, it will show unreported usage. That's what these fields are for down here. So the unreported usage would be um, how much leave has been used since the last pay. So when the next time that payroll is ran, um, then that field will get updated. Um, for vacation, same thing as sick. Um, if they accumulate per month, then they have to add in what they're accumulating, what their max amount would be, what they can go up to before it will stop accumulating. And then the reset value, that's only used for personnel. And then their balance. So they'll have a balance once they um, give them, start giving them accumulation. Um, let's see, what's the next one other thing they can do? If they use the max advanced sick leave, um, that contains the number of advanced sick days, hours available for the employee. Um, so if an employee, maybe some districts give their employees extra sick leave. So if they give them extra five days, and once they run through that 240 days for their balance is 500, or excuse me, 54, once they run through that, then they start borrowing from this um, max advance leave right here. And then once they start, um, once they're out of that, then they're out of sick leave. Um, once they start accumulating, um, they can start uh, starts paying back the max leave amount, and then um, they will have their um, sick days back. So again, uh, some districts use a max advance leave, some don't. Um, anything else on the leave? Okay. Um, just trying to think if I missed anything on there. I don't think I did. I think I hit everything on there. Okay. I'll just say that employee. Um, one thing I did want to mention also, if you click like highlighted like in the field, you're going to see this little box open up here. And I use this a lot. Um, you can see um, where it came in when they imported in from Classic and then the usage for every absence or accrual. That's been very helpful to me on certain things. So I can see. Um, maybe what they did. So just a reminder, they, the option is out there for that. Okay, so to create a leave, you just create and add in the information for the employee and save. Um, other thing that we have here is the accumulations tab. And the accumulations is, um, this is where you could create a, uh, a, a accumulation for one employee at a time. So if employee needs to get um, accumulation for their sick, and then again, has to be in the open posting period. And mine's September right now. And then I just created one for and these are all imported in. So again, you can't delete or view those or uh, edit those. You can only view the ones that are imported in. But now you see that I accumulated um, a sick day for my employees. So maybe a new employee just came in and you, they automatically get three weeks. You can do that right here. 
and give them their sick leave and vacation one person at a time. Okay, any questions on leaves and accumulations? I'm trying to stick to my time here. Sorry if I go over a little bit. Okay. The next thing, the next thing would be our organization. So organization, um, this would be all your uh, district um, district data. So this should be all set up already for classic employees um, when they are for classic when they import over. Um, so this information will come over. And then this is, um, if you're used to classic, it's the USB con screen. Um, so it shows your name of the district, the address, and then the federal EIN number, state EIN, ODJFS number, the SERS code, and STRS code. Now they added a new option here. Um, this has been here for about a year or two, maybe the top part, but they just added uh, the submit to STRS. That's coming on the next release of 6.61, which I believe is next Friday, maybe, or this Friday. But I just wanted to put it in here because my screen shows it, just so you know for your districts coming up for advance, um, that this new box down here has been added. So what this is, because this was uh, an option that really districts were asking for, is the timestamp and, the, and, and the, uh, the date and the time that it was sent. So now they know um, did I did I send it? Did I submit it? They're you know officers maybe saying I didn't get your file. Well now they can go in here and say well I did submit it. I do have a timestamp on here. So now they have that just like it did in USP Con. Now they have that in there. But again that won't be coming on until this next release coming up here in a, uh, either this Friday or next Friday. Um, the SERS advance this only gets updated in um, when when the district goes into advance. So. Uh, the current advance is what is the current advance amount. So that's the total amount that they're, they, when they went to advance, what it is. This is non modifiable. Um, if they're in advance, this will be checked. And then the amount paid back. So every time um, the district runs a payroll, it's going to show the amount that's paying back. And these two should match by their last payroll for a SERS advance. So. And if it doesn't, then they can run that report under home and um, do the Chexter's advance report. So just remember to use that report option. So that is your um, organization. So the next one is your paid distributions. And your paid distributions for uh, the classic uh, people, um, that's your dead screen that mimics that. And it's paid distributions would be, um, well, dead screen would be, because back in, in classic, you could do uh, create your direct deposits using the 700s for dead screen. But now we don't have that option and this where you do the payroll items, it has a separate tab and now it's under core. So, so the paid distributions are listed here. Again, you can view, edit, or um, delete. I think it's only archived actually. If they're um, been um, referenced to, you cannot delete them. So you want to create you select the employee, and if the employee already has one, um, it's going to bring up a box that says already a paid distribution on there. So you can just go down here and say, oh, I need to add, um, he wants to be, get paid by check now and a direct deposit. So you're going to need uh, a code needs to be entered in. A lot of times districts are used to the 700s. That's what they were used to. But again, they can put in a code of what they want. Um, is it fixed or percent? They already have a direct deposit as a percent of 100%, but this person wants a check to be distributed to him 
um, for $100 every pay, and then the remainder goes into the direct deposit, they can do that. And then when you save that, and now they have a direct deposit for the 100% and then check for the 100 as a rate. So um, now this employee will get both. If you need to edit, you can edit this. If it's going to be maybe, um, and again, if the employee decides to go completely check and they don't want to do direct deposit anymore, um, then they would have to, um, yes, you can delete it. And then you can just edit that and then they can do 100%. And now the employee gets a check for 100% instead of doing the direct deposit. But again, they can break it down into, um, as long as they have a 100% going somewhere, they can break it down on the rest of uh, fixed percents of if they have like a couple savings accounts they want it to be distributed to, they can also do that. Okay, any questions on, and again, audit report is available for this too. So just a reminder on there, I can keep on forgetting that let you know which options that is available to you. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I think I just wanted to mention, um, we did have where um, people were missing certain fields and now we added a check and they cannot save this without these codes that are in red because before they were saving them without and they were running into a lot of problems for direct deposits um, once it got to the payroll um, in CH um, they were missing information so now the district cannot go any further without that information So they enter the information in. So if I say, oh, I'm, I forgot that box, I'm just gonna select one, try to save it. I gotta let me. Now it lets me. So it's just uh, a check and balance now. So districts don't um, miss those important ones that they need to be added before they um, get to the end of their payroll. Just want to mention that. And again, audit report. Okay. The pay groups. The pay group is, um, this would be like your USP dad and pay group in um, Classic. So now you can create a pay group. Excuse me. Job calendar and then create a new pay code if you need to. So let's create a 50. This is my test. So if you have a new pay group for uh, employees in your district or for your district's employees, um, they can do that. And they can also archive them so they don't show on here. If there's um, pay groups that they don't use anymore and they don't want to show on here, they can archive them. But if they want to show them, then they just click the include archive and they'll show on the grid. So it just cleans up your grid a little bit. And then you have your create a new option, create new where it won't close. You can just continue creating new. And now you see my pay group is here. So again, you can change the job calendar that it's associated to if need be and the description. So now I can attach it to a, a job calendar if I want to. Okay. Let's see what else I want to unless. Um, deleting of the calendars, again, you cannot delete any. Um, again, you can archive them. 
um, but um, if it's associated with uh, with pay history, you cannot delete them. So that's why you would have to archive them if you no longer use them. Because if they're if you created a calendar and you didn't want it and it hasn't been associated with any data yet, any reference to history, you can delete it at that time. But once it's um, ran through, like attached to somebody's payroll, um, then you cannot delete them anymore. So that's why we brought up the option to include the um, archive. The next one is our payee. And your payee is going to be similar to your dead name um, deduction name record in um, classic for your classic people. Um, the payee screen is used to add a name and address um, for the payroll item that it's going to be attached to. Um, so they relate together. Um, works like a vendor number, like it did in dead name and deduction name in classic. So you can assign a one payee record to multiple payroll item configurations. So stating, um, I'll just do one for right now. And here's one. Um, so if you have a new payee, maybe for a new, um, let's see, a new insurance company, you would have to create a payee for it in order for it to be attached to the payroll item when you're creating that new payroll item. Um, your item configuration, it needs to have that payee created first in order for it to be available when you're in the pay, 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 payroll item configuration. I'm just, so this is where you would create that. So to create a new one, you would enter. So this would be like a vendor number that USAS can use on the USAS side. I'm just going to, I don't know what to call it. And I'm just going to say it's test insurance because they have a new test insurance company coming up. You can do a second name. Electronic payment. Is this payment going to be electronically sent through the bank or am I going to physically cut a check? So either you click it for electronic payment, but if it's going to be a check and we're going to cut one, then you leave it blank. The address. Mm, I'll just click that. Um, so this is my address for the um, insurance company. Um, you can include fax number in that if you need. And then once the payee is no longer used, if it's an OPE, you can go ahead and archive that and it won't show on the grid anymore if you don't want to see it. So once I save that, now my new payee is created. And now um, I can use that when I'm setting up my new payroll item configuration for my new insurance for our district and that payee directly ties to it. And, and the check will use the payee information um, for their address and all the information to be uh, cut for the check to be cut. Right. See anything else? That. Any questions on the PE portion? And on the grid there, it does show um, if it's archived or archived, excuse me, it does, but I mean the electronic payment, so you can see which ones are um, electronic payment or true. And again, you have your more option, you can add more options to that, so you can see more grids. Okay, the next one is our payroll accounts. Okay, so your payroll accounts would be for your employees, uh, what their uh, account they're gonna be paid into. So the payroll expenditure accounts, they're created in USAS first, and then, um, then they can be, well, they can be created here too, but they have to also be um, available in USAS. So when payrolls uh, submission uh, to USAS um, meets each other for the seat, it, um, it records uh, that it's in payroll and it's in the accounting side. So you just want to make sure your accounts are set up on both sides. So if you need to create a new account for an employee, just click an employee. And again, a position has to be created first. And then, the, of course, the payroll account has already been included for this employee. 
So then you go ahead and um, create the account. So you can add accounts this, to this um, employee if need be. So if you need to add a couple more accounts, you select add and the expenditure. And right now it shows all the expenditures that are available to the district, um, but they're working on right now where only um, maybe when they're in up to Cal future or current, when they're selecting the employee, like I said, they're only gonna have accounts that are located here. So that way, when they're trying to pay this employee, they don't have um, 500 accounts that they got to choose from. Um, so they're working on that to match the USAS portion of it. So right here, then you can figure out, again, you can add by clicking on just maybe the first one, if you know, uh, or if you don't know the account, you can just select the very first part of it. And it has to be the first part. Or if you know maybe a, a, a few and then that's only going to list, so there's only 37 now. So just to make it a little easier, if you don't know the account, but you know the beginning of it, you can just do like the 001-1100 um, to get to, um, to break it down a little bit in the selection. The districts probably have a lot to choose from. So I'm just going to pick one. And then we're going to create, is it active, inactive, specific, or maximum amount in effect? So if the account is active, then you click the percent. Or is it a fixed amount going to that account? So 100%, or if it's fixed, only $50 every pay is going to go into this account. And the remainder is going to go into this um, active 100% account. Um, maybe it's a grant and they can do a max amount. So then they would type in, um, they have this max this account is $10,000 for a grant. So I want the max amount of for 10,000 pay or 10,000 divided by 20 pays. Uh, we'll just do the amount to be. 384, 61, every. So I believe you do the max amount and then you do the fix and then you do the charge amount. It's not this much, right? So the 10,000 needs to be divided between like the amount of your um, amount to be charged for the each pay. And then every pay, every time it gets down to the pay, it will do the remaining max. So, um, so once I think they save, let me see if I save this right. Yes. So every pay, it's going to go down every time they run a pay and that amount, it deducts down. So until it gets to that 10,000. So you can divide up how many times, like maybe it's for a one year grant, you can divide between their semi-monthly or monthly, and then it will uh, put that amount in every pay. And then again, you can do a start and stop date of when it stops. If the employer distribution or the leave projection, again, the employer distribution is if they don't want uh, anything for the employer portion, uh, what the bank, what the district pays for the district and their taxes, um, like Medicare, um, their surge retirement, uh, their insurance for health. This is what this would be for. Um, if they click this, that account would be picked up when they run the employer distribution report, and it would take this account. And it would take the object code and change it to another account so that way the districts can keep track of how much is getting paid um, for re board retirement, um, board Medicare pickup. Um, same goes for the leave projection. If they want to use this account um, to be um, for leave projection, 
um, then they, they would run their leave rejection report. It would take that account that they were originally paid out of and take that amount and put it into the projection um, account that they have set up in order to keep track of their leave projection on the USAS side. Um, specific, that would be um, if they only use it maybe once in a while, um, they can go ahead and set up this specific account. And then when they're running the payroll in current or um, future and they're selecting the accounts, they have that option to select these specific accounts. So they may not be used all the time. Um, so um, they can create them here and only pick them up when um, when they are needed to be paid out of because maybe they're not paid out of that account all the time, but they want it to be there so it's easily um, accessible. Okay. Again, you have your audit report. I just want to make sure you saw that. Um, this is one that um, the audit report was available for. Um, so if I save it and I run the audit report, again, you'll be able to see that information that I just entered. And I think that was the wrong employee. I said it. So since I didn't update, it's not, of course, not going to show any updates. But again, I just want to just remind you, once you get add or update um, payroll accounts for employee, make sure you can use the auto report that's right there on the screen. Okay, um, trying to continue on here. Getting there, payroll item. So the payroll item, um, once employee has been created, they can start creating the payroll items for the employee. And the payroll items is uh, the same like in dead screen and classic. So once an employee gets created, you have to make sure you create an employee um, for each um, deduction. Like most places always have a federal record. We'll have a state, unless they're out of state and they might have an Indiana instead. Um, they have a city and they have a SERS and STRS. So they can either have one or the other, or maybe they're both. And then I have the annuity. So if any, for maybe their health insurance, um, Medicare record, most of them will have Medicare, or they might have FICA if there's a student services or, or uh, student workers or board members. So how to create, once you got a new employee, and you need to create the payroll item. You find the employee that you created. Excuse me. Then I go in and find my federal tax first and continue. So then here is your payroll items for federal tax. And again, you can do templates for this. So once you create a template for your district, you can do that, I believe, for employee, position, and payroll items. Those are the three you can do your uh, create templates to save your, your district a little time. So again, you can create a default record um, for federal tax. It's all set up, where, where we go. All I have to do is make sure if they're using the old W, if they're not using, well, new employees will automatically be using the new W-4. But old, old employees, um, they can still be attached to the old way of taxing um, of the W-2 um, during tax federal taxing. But for new employees, uh, they always have to use a new W-4 now. So for me, I'm a new employee, so I have to use that. So again, it has to be tax tables. There's no rates. Um, every pay of the month, if I want additional withholdings, I want $10 extra dollars to come out of my pay. So I get a little bit more money back at the end of a tax season. Um, automatically uh, check the pension pension plan box if they were if they have retirement withholding, or yes, check the pension plan box, or no, never check the pension plan box. Are they single or married? And again, the number of exceptions. But again, if they're using the new W-4, I it doesn't look at this anymore. It looks at this box down here. 
So these boxes are still here, but if you're using number div four, this is what matters and make sure they have the single or filed, married or filing, married, filed jointly, or the head of household selected. And the two like jobs, again, we have documentation for this. Um, if you have more questions on it, on exactly what the system is doing when it's calculating it during payroll, and then an annual dependent amount, annual other income, or the annual deduction amount. Okay. Um, you can start uh, at this date range if you want, or you can leave it blank and it will just automatically start when the next payroll starts. Um, the error adjustments, this is mostly uh, pretty much on all the payroll items. If they need to do an adjustment for an employee that maybe they um, made a mistake and paid SERS instead of STRS, they can do a negative to SERS and do a positive to SERS error adjustment. And during payroll, it picks up those payroll error adjustments and does the figuring for you and the calculation of all the taxes. Or maybe they got a refund of an annuity back. Um, and they need to pay the employee back, they can do that right here in the error adjustment um, and get that money back to the employee as a negative. Um, it's preferably that you use this error adjustment to do any corrections like that because the system automatically knows how to tax it. If it, they know it's annuity or if it knows it was a regular, um, if it's annuity, it knows that it has to tax it now because it's income. So just want to really make sure that the districts use uh, the error adjustments um, if, if to do all that because it does the system knows how to calculate everything for them. Again, on each of the payroll items, you're going to see the historical totals down here. Every payroll is going to be updated. You have your year to date, fiscal to date, quarter to date, and month to date totals. And then you have your COVID-19 amounts, which need to be added in a pipe right before W-2 time. Um, if your district is paying employees for the COVID-19, I'm not sure how many will be doing that anymore. I, um, maybe still this year, probably yet, um, but it's always out there and they can use that um, to make sure those amounts get reported when they run their W-2. And then they can just remove those um, before they, um, and I believe if you go under federal mass change, um, federal tax, there is a thing in there where you can just uh, delete out those COVID or mass change. Okay. Oh. Thought I was trying to add something. And again, you can run auto report for each payroll item that you add if you want to do a double check. And it will just show your federal tax there. There we go. So then you will continue on adding um, a payroll item for each. So you would just find that employee and you have to continue creating a payroll item. So they would, I need a state record. They would need a city record. And then they can continue on down in selecting um, what retirement are these SERS or SERS. Now, if they have a SERS record, um, maybe they are, um, they have two jobs, maybe they're superintendent, but then another job they have, they don't get paid um, full pickup, um, um, pickup for retirement or something. Um, here is where you can select um, maybe his, if I had a job, I don't have a job listed, but if it was a job, you can select job position one. Um, when he gets paid that, he gets uh, paid uh, his retirement fully through the board. But if he gets paid through his second job, which is maybe um, um, Paul uh, works in the cafeteria during lunch, but he doesn't get full pickup for retirement on that, here he can do job position two. And that is, on, and then that knows that to look at payroll items for um, when he gets paid only to look at the the fourteen percent for that for that employee. So it just depends. Uh, otherwise, if the employee gets paid normal for every job for the same retirement or same Medicare, then you would not select a position. That's only if they are getting paid two different jobs and they're getting. Um, 
pick up and pick up, full pick up on one and not on the other. So otherwise, just leave it blank. And that will, every time it gets paid for every job, it will pay the right portion for retirement, right? And in Medicare. So, so you just select automatically. Again, you can create a template. You can get them all set up and ready to go for every payroll item. So you don't have to um, click on the defluxers, enters all the information in, new employee has it all in there. Now, if they're increased compensation, you wanna make sure you um, select that and that's for your stirs and serves. And that will make sure that when they're reported to uh, serves that they're getting, um, showing that their in income is increased by that portion of um, the extra portion of what the board is paying. So it just helps them at retirement time. And just click save and the record gets saved. Um, also here on this retired rehiree. So if an employee, service employee or service employee is retired um, and they're kind of, they're leaving but coming back. So you wanna make sure you select this and check that box um, when they come back and start working. So maybe they're just gonna sub for some extra um, time and day, you know, to give something to do. Um, or a lot of teachers retire and, and get rehired back in, they make sure they do that because the system wants to know when they're reported on the search report or search report, they want to know this. The search charge exempt, that is for search only. And should they be included in the search charge exempt? Um, should not be included on that. Um, then you want to make sure you click, select that search charge. So when they run that report, and I think search sends the district report yearly of who um, these, they have to pay a certain amount if they're under, um, they didn't make the certain mark of their surcharge for SERS, they have to pay them um, a, a, a fee and, and they paid um, SERS then. Okay, we're at noon and I still have a lot to go. Um, I think for the payroll items, I'll stop now because pretty much it's self-explanatory because it's just, you have to make sure you add um, your right deductions for every employee. And then what I wanted to show up here was the payroll item is if you wanna see just like in the grid, a certain thing, you can just select like regular item. And then that will just bring up all the regular um, 600 codes or, well, not necessarily 600, it just depends how your district uses them, but we'll see there's 600s or regular type annuity. So you can break down the column a little bit more if you just want to see all the city tax records for employees. You can do that by selecting that payroll item up here. And it just brings in all the city records. Um, if you want to see the employer portion, um, right now, when you're on that main screen in the grid, when you just go right directly to payroll, it's not showing on here. <laughs> Excuse me. It's only showing the rate for the employee portion. And for now, until we get to add it under more, they will have to go directly to either the regular where it is, if it's an annuity, um, then they have to go directly to that grid and then it will show there. So um, just a reminder there, if districts are looking for that, it is there. It's just that they have to go directly to that, um, select that payroll item. Any questions on the payroll item configuration? The next one is the position. And again, this is the position of the record for the employee. So again, you have to add an employee first and then add a position for the employee, then the compensation, and then you can do the payroll counts. So to create a position, and I just had created myself, Again, you have templates. Like I said, employee, payroll items, and positions have templates. So if you already have a position um, record already set up in the, the templates, you can choose that. Again, you can have it for maybe teachers. You can have a separate template for secretaries, a separate template for subs. 
um, bus drivers. You can have as many as you want broken down and ready all the information entered in and all you have to do is enter in a few things and save it. It just saves you a lot of time. So I just put in there that I'm eligible for all my leave and active. Just see. It's like your pay group. Just like that. It's a certified or classified employee. Again, you can have your building codes. If you have uh, districts with multiple buildings and departments broken down, FTE. What is the higher date? I'll just put in the date. Is this a supplemental contract? Yes or no? And then let's go over that here next. So, okay, so this is a non modifiable um, record. And again, this is. Uh, when you select a position type under EMIS um, information, um, this will be selected. So in here, you can't select it. That will automatically be selected when you're doing the EMIS um, portion of it um, on the position. See, my EMIS related is all worked up. I don't understand that. That should be down here. It's very weird. Um, so this supplemental, it just depends on what we're selecting down here. So the start and stop dates of the pay group are when it should start. Is this retirement code? Um, you want to make sure um, maybe work employees may not have um, service or service retirement or um, maybe board members. Um, so then you want to make sure you select what your retirement is. Um, you only enter a termination date when they're no longer working in that position. And if they have a supervisor code or a supervisor, you can select that. Um, EMIS related, that should be down here in the staff. This should be, um, if this employee reportable to EMIS, position code. So what is this? Is it a principal, supervisor, treasurer? State reporting appointment die, is it certified or classified? Position type, is it a regular or supplemental? So this, I believe when you click the supplemental, I believe that's when that gets checked. Position status, active. And this information is used when they report to EMIS for staff or staff reporting. Do they have a special education full-time? If they have a low grade, what can they teach up to? What if they have a separation? What was their separation? Retirement employer, deceased, resigned. This is stuff they would have to add when they actually leave the district. Do they have a paraprofessional license? And then they can enter this amount here. If they need to override uh, their contract or con contract work days, hours and days, um, this is what EMIS would look like. If this is not filled in, it will look at the compensation itself. But this is an override if this, if they need to add different information in for EMIS reporting, they can go here and add that in these two boxes here, or these three here, I should say. And then the high grade, what they teach, and then a separation date is when they leave the district what building IRN they're in, do they have experience in the current class, and any extended service days. Okay, so once that information is entered in, you can save it. And again, audit report, and run it to make sure that that um, looks good before you move on. So now I have my position created for my person. And again, you can go back and edit, save, 
or you can delete. Okay, so, so another thing really really with dark ID, when, when you are kind of in the way um, on the position, what is it are our hiding from? Is this one right now? It's going to hide from new contract, attended this, EMI entry, your current your future. future. You need to get all processing safety board, your tax, your tax estimator, estimator, benefit and application reports, EMI session reports, and your way of application reports. I'm just going to name that out. So the next one is the first personnel. We're getting getting, getting close here. here. Sorry, sorry, we went over that. that. Um, there's just so, so much information. Um, this, this is once, once you, get you get your position, position created, created that you just did, did. Now, now they will show, show here. here. You can only add that if you're done. done. And it's this exact exactly like the employee personnel. Which is just a search for you like I just did. And then now I show up. So, so some these are for me, me for you. We waited in the district for my own business issues. They would have. So I saw all you the um, personal notes are so only for this employee. But at that you can see that that kind of manager is the staff. If we can get the issues in certain ways, they want to just start other managers to be utilized for supporting. That's how they can't have a certain thing to do. Okay, she's a person who is 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 of the meeting and you need some information. The next one, one is, is your personal security area. Andrea, your audio is, Andrea, your audio is really bad right now. I don't know what's going on, but it is. We, yeah. Is that better? Is that no. Better? No. no. It sounds like something else is turned on, like it's echoing. So I don't know. Yeah, because it really, it was kind of starting to do it, but now it's really bad. You can't even hardly hear what you're saying. I know that's last time I happened when I can't hear what it was. What was going on? Yeah, it's really echoing. Maybe mute, can you mute yourself and then try unmuting yourself? I don't know, it's just very echoey. Did that work? No. It's not better. better. No. Is it echoing, echoing for everybody? everybody? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yep, it sounds like it is. Maybe I can I don't know why that's bad. Um, the only way we do it is, is but if I leave, it will stop my, um, I don't know what else is just going on. Yeah, because it's it just like it just happened. It, it was, it started and it, it's just progressively getting worse. So I don't know if it's like Zoom itself. Yeah, then everybody would have to go back in as yeah. well. Shoot. I don't know what to do. Why is it doing it? Yeah, yeah, she can't understand anything. So it must be a big issue. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Because it was fine to, at the beginning. And it just seems like it's been getting progressively worse. Lori, you want to do the postal series for me? Well, we may have to do that. Maybe we can have uh, 
either that I could just go over what, what's remaining on Friday if we want to. That way, that way we'll be able to. So what do you have left? Just posting periods? Okay, yeah. Yeah, let's just do that. Let's just wrap it up for today. And then I will uh, go ahead and go over that on Friday as well. Let me just Simon. Yeah, I don't know. Let's, why don't we just plan on doing that? Because, I, I mean, obviously, it is really bad. You can't even understand what you're saying. So, let's up. Um, does, does anybody need to go back any further than the posting periods? I know, you know before that, I was starting to get a little bit, you know, echoey. So, I mean, if anybody wants to go back further than posting periods, why don't you go ahead and let me know right now? And then when we go over it on Friday, we can we can talk about it, anything that was you know that needs to be reviewed. Okay, then you might stuff. So, so I, I think we take a look. I think let's see how my last year. year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The last EMIS stuff. Yeah. So you know, well, I'll go over position. Let's say I'll go, I'll start a position posting period and do the dashboard. And, and then that way, at least we can kind of cover that as well. We'll go over that again. Is there anything else that anybody couldn't, couldn't hear or wants, wants to go over other than the position? Okay, let's just plan on that. On Friday, we'll go over position, posting periods, dashboard. Um, and if there's if there's anything else in between time, just go ahead and let it send an email to Andrea and let us know, and we can definitely uh, definitely go over that on Friday. We apologize for the the audio, but I I have a feeling it has to all meet, most be a Zoom issue because. I think Andrea, I'm I'm not echoing when I, when I talk, but to, on your, am I? Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's almost got to be something either that or it's your your uh, internet. So okay, well let's plan on that then on Friday. We'll just go ahead and cover the rest of those, and tomorrow we'll just stick with our day two uh, agenda and go from there. That sound good to everybody? Can't change my thinking. Not any better. Nope, nope. you're still echoing. Okay, thank you, everybody. Okay, everybody have a great day.